Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, R.R. Slugger, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, we celebrate Slugger's second birthday, two full years on YouTube, over a hundred videos. I can hardly believe it. And uh, today, I wanted to celebrate the occasion by going through and offering up a director-style commentary about every single video. It's not going to be the most in-depth thing possible if I spend more than even a minute talking about each video. <laughs> this video itself is going to be over an hour long, so we'll see how it goes uh, as we go through it here today. But I wanted to take this opportunity to reminisce and uh, maybe share some behind-the-scenes stuff as well. So without further ado, let's take it all the way back to the beginning, the very first video. I think the first uh, point of importance here is how long the pre-production of this series took. <laughs> so much time went into creating some of this stop motion animation, doing the research behind the scenes, going through and uh, discovering other stuff that uh, other creators had made for Rock Raiders uh, before I came along and trying to incorporate all of that into the Rock Raiders retrospective series. Uh, if you're looking for more of an origin story behind Slugger and this channel, you need to check out the first birthday episode, because uh, I think that's where I go through the most, uh, the majority of it there. Um, but here with the first episode of um, the Rock Raiders retrospective series, I think I did a pretty good job here. I think this one holds up quite well. Um, although you are going to notice, at least in this video and the Hover Scout video, there is a shifting aspect ratio. I hadn't quite figured all the ins and outs of the program uh, just yet. So whenever stop motion animation is on screen, like, like this here, you'll notice these black bars pop up along the sides. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, uh, hadn't quite figured out how to make everything align properly just yet. Um, some of the photography is also like that at this stage too. Um, but within just a couple of videos, we've got that sorted out. Um, so I think I think we see a lot of uh, growth very quickly uh, in these first few videos. The Hover Scout video is very much the same in a lot of ways. Um, it's it was made just before I, I moved. Um, I've actually lived in three different places uh, during during my my run on YouTube here, so I remember this one coming kind of coming down to the wire. I remember packing things up as I was <laughs> making this video and uh, publishing it. So yeah, with the Rapid Rider video, I will make a point to mention the old uh, fonts that I used to use here. I was still working on which font or typeface I, I preferred for Rock Raiders. So I think this one was called Base 05. Um, it's all right, it's all right, it's not my favorite now. Um, so I moved on from that pretty quickly. I enjoyed making the Rapid Rider video quite a bit. There, there was a lot of uh, fun elements here and the uh, alternate builds of course were, were interesting too. Uh, there was some really good stop motion in this one I felt. And I think by and large, I was starting to get, get a feel for the for the uh, the project here, the uh, the process, I should say. And then one day I just lost my mind <laughs> and decided that I needed to go through and catalog every single Rock Raiders piece in a video, uh, along with photos of each piece and uh, what year they were introduced, what year they retired, all that information all in one go. Um, I don't know what, what necessarily compelled me to do this, <laughs> but uh, it, it took so much work. <laughs> it was just such a massive undertaking. Um, I am still eternally grateful to the composers that um, allowed me to use their music in the video, because even though uh, I had composed some Rock Raiders music up to this point, and in fact this video is the first video that has the search and rescue song, uh, which kind of has more or less become the theme song for the for the channel. Um, I, this is still a half hour long video and there was no way I had enough music to cover the full run time. So uh, many of these composers stepped up to the plate and helped out, uh, not by necessarily composing music for the video, but just allowing me to use their music that they had composed for other Rock Raiders related projects uh, within the video here. And uh, yeah. Yeah. In the end, I'm really happy that I actually 
did all this front end work here, going through and taking a photo of every single <laughs> piece in Rock Raiders, uh, because throughout the series, whenever I needed to talk about any of these pieces in particular, I could just grab the photo that's already saved on my computer. I didn't have to go set up another shot of the of the piece or whatever. I, I have them all saved in a folder. And I believe that same, uh, that same folder is available in the uh, description of the uh, the video as well too. So if you need a photo of every single Rack Raiders piece on your computer, you know where to look. Since making the video, LEGO has actually gone and released a few of the Dark Turquoise pieces uh, that were previously either set exclusive to Rock Raiders or retired. So that's exciting that um, the video is actually already out of date, and I think that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, it basically means that we are getting new pieces to enjoy uh, in our Rock Raiders models. There are a few errors in the video here as well. Um, and that's gonna come to be a reoccurring theme all throughout the channel. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, even though I do a ton of research into these things, uh, I'm only human and I make, I make mistakes too. So, um, it is what it is. <laughs> ah, yes, uh, the most expensive video I have ever made. <laughs> I, th I think it still holds that that uh, prestigious award as well, too. <laughs> uh, it's basically just because I bought Chief, and that was the big deal about this video. Um, you know what? Actually, I believe, uh, I believe the prototype Nick has dethroned it, now that I think of it. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, but for now, I had a lot of fun making all of these weird stop motion animations with Chief in them. <laughs> Some of them have reappeared in future videos, which is good because uh, I always try to make stop motion animation that I can reuse at a later date. I don't want to make one and done sort of things uh, because I'm, I'm doing it for um, efficiency's sake in a lot of re in a lot of regards, right? Uh, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to make stop motion animation, and it's, it serves me better if I can reuse it later on down the line. Obviously, I don't necessarily recommend going out and buying Chief for yourself, um, but I thought I'd have some fun with it nonetheless. So now we come to the Granite Grinder video, and this is the first one on, on my channel that I felt I really nailed it. I, um, I feel feel strongly that this is the first great video on Slugger's channel. So one of the topics that I bring up in this video is the idea of juniorization. And this was something I was just seeing in the community discourse at the time, uh, online LEGO communities and whatnot. Uh, basically, it's the belief that sets in the year, you know, 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, were, uh, were no good because they um, were using big pieces and maybe simpler construction uh, compared to sets that came out previously. And basically, I was kind of taking this um, opportunity to try to debunk the whole juniorization thing, uh, or at least point out that it's not concrete. It's not something that can be measured by a metric. It is purely opinionated, uh, so it's, it's a subjective opinion. I believe this set is juniorized because that sort of thing, right? So that was so somewhat irksome to me, just to see folks chalk up Rock Raiders and Town Junior and all these other other series as being juniorized and therefore no good. Um, so. I wanted to kind of push back against that a little bit and try to put juniorization under a microscope, hopefully um, inspiring folks to maybe take a step back and look at it a little bit more critically. Uh, I think juniorization is often just used as an excuse to say that I don't like something um, without having to say it's my opinion that I don't like this thing. It's more more so used as like, it's juniorized, how could anybody like it, right? So <laughs> I don't know. Another aspect I found very successful about this video was it was the first one where I really dove into the prototype aspect of Rock Raiders and the design iterations that uh, it went through. The Granite Grinder is the perfect set for doing that with because we have so much material to look at, so many different renditions of the Granite Grinder, um, especially compared to other LEGO themes, let alone Rock Raiders. So I, I really enjoyed doing that with this set and I feel like the video does a strong job of going through and talking about it. 
Um, this is also one of the spots where I started uh, really diving into modifications and alternate builds as, as a focus for each of the videos, uh, because I had made several modifications to the granite grinder, and I wanted to show them off here as well. I think the last thing I'll mention here is Donald Gregorich, uh, who designed the Cavern Crusher, actually reached out to me uh, via email because he had seen my video. <laughs> and so he shared some of his, uh, his insight into um, his experience with that. Uh, basically what ended up happening is he had sent a photo of a set that or a mock that he had built to the Lego group It looked nothing like the cavern crusher. He, he told me it's just something that the designers kind of made up uh, after the fact um, But he won some sort of contest and he got awarded a free set of his choosing and he chose Amazon ancient ruins, so I think he made a really strong solid choice there, uh, but it was really cool just hearing from him so <laughs> that, that was that was really neat. One of the perks of uh, doing this uh, this uh, internet series, I suppose. Next up is the loader dozer, and while maybe not as great a video compared to the granite grinder, I feel like this was a solid follow up nonetheless. This also marked the first time where both of the sets. Uh, the videos for the sets were designed or created behind the scenes concurrently. I remember doing the um, granite grinder and the loader dozer photo shoots simultaneously. So that, that's something that I do nowadays all the time is I'll be working on multiple video projects at the same time. Whereas prior to the granite grinder and the loader dozer, uh, it was just a one, one and done sort of affair. I'd go through and do each one separately. So that's kind of interesting. Um, also with this video and the Granite Grinder uh, video, which I forgot to mention, we're seeing the emergence of a new uh, new font, new typeface uh, for the series here. So instead of using the old Base 05 one, this is um, Hotel Paris XE, I think is what it's called. And uh, it's a great font. It's a great font. It, it came along with the uh, software that I make the videos with. The Loader Dozer is just all around a weaker set, in my opinion, uh, compared to the Granite Grinder. And so I didn't have as many favorable things to say about it in the video, I think. Um, I think my modification of the set speaks volumes too, where I, I did uh, significant changes to the model, trying to improve upon the amount of detail that it had, because it was, it was somewhat lacking beforehand. So, yeah. Still haven't heard from Ian Porapat yet. <laughs> we'll see if he uh, sees the video and reaches out to me too. <laughs> I would actually really like to know the story behind that uh, that hover transport there, uh, because that is from the back of the box of the loader dozer, whereas the cavern crusher wasn't. It was a whole new build. So yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. I'm curious to learn what happened there. I think the message at the end of this video really rings true even to this day, um, where basically I say it doesn't matter if it's got 80 pieces or 800 pieces. If you have fun with it, you know, that's what matters at the end of the day. So that's, uh, that's something to uh, continue holding true, I think. One final thing I'll note here before moving to the next one is that the ending uh, the outro for each of these videos. Back then, it was uh, very experimental. It was like every single video was a new way to end it. Uh, I had a rough outline of what I wanted it to look like, but each time I'd build it up from scratch. And this might come as a shock to some folks here, but the whole um, the whole logo and the the danger stripes and the tools moving side to side, it's different every single time. It's not a pre-saved video. I reconstruct it every single time I make a video, even to this day. Um, and the reason for doing that is because I, um, I'd i never know how long I want it to extend for, or how fast I, I want the, uh, the tools to move, or when I want the fade out to occur. And honestly, it's just become such a force of habit. I, I, I've just got the, the coordinates memorized and everything. I just know how to construct it. It takes me all of 10 minutes uh, each time I do it. And uh, that, that's why every single video on this on this channel, every single Rock Raiders video has a different ending to it. <laughs> Subtle, but different. 
How to build a slimy slug from Lego Rock Raiders. <laughs> This video was a bit of an experimentation. I wanted to try out different forms of communicating building instructions in a video format. So I wasn't sure if stop motion was the way to go, if step-by-step -step photos were the way to go, if a parts list, wh whatever, right? I was going through the motions here trying to figure out what worked and looking for feedback from the community because I was getting ready to start the How to Build Rock Raiders series, which is still ongoing to this day and uh, I didn't know what approach to take just yet. So that's what the purpose of this video was, in addition to, of course, showing off these different slimy slug models. I didn't design either model here, and the, uh, the designers are listed, of course, in the description, along with links to their original models, but I still found it um, an interesting exercise, nonetheless, to go through and, and do this. Along with the every single LEGO Rock Riders piece video, the Race for Survival read-through and reenactment uh, through photography was a video idea I knew I wanted to do right from the very beginning of the channel. This is, um, this is such a passion project, this video here, and to this day it's still one of my all-time favorites. Uh, I love how I was able to to kind of recapture that uh, that Thomas the Tank Engine sort of uh, memories of, of watching the old British television show uh, growing up through the narration here and recreating all the photos for it, basically reanimating the, the story, re-illustrating re rather the story was a lot of fun to do. A ton of work though, holy moly, it was a ton of work. Uh, I think in general, folks um, over estimate how long it takes to do stop motion animation and underestimate how long it takes to set up photos. Stop motion animation is more time consuming, yes. I'm not I'm not trying to <laughs> argue against that, of course. At the same time, setting up some of these shots took a significant amount of work and time. <laughs> so, all for one photo. I remember being very uh <laughs> Uh, almost disheartened after setting up a huge scene, getting the, the focus just right, snapping the picture, and then realizing, oh, well, I have to take it all down now and set up the next shot a half hour later, right? So it took a lot of work and it took a long time, and I, I think the results are really great. I would have loved to have done this with more Rock Raiders novels, but unfortunately, this is the one. That's it. Uh, there, there's the uh, High Adventure Deep Underground uh, comic book, graphic novel, I suppose. Um, and I've shared my mostly negative opinions <laughs> on, on that one before. And uh, there's also the uh, puzzle book as well. But the puzzle book doesn't really tell much of a story. There isn't really much to narrate. So ne neither one of those outings are um, even half as good as this, as this book, I feel. And then all the way out of left field, 4960 Giant Zoo. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this might have been a bit of a culture shock to some folks watching the channel back in the, back then, uh, because nothing leading up to this point had had any sort of tonal shift anywhere remotely close to this. <laughs> um, acquiring the set, I remember acquiring the set. I had to order it in from Denmark. Um, and it was so expensive, and, and <laughs> I remember doing the stop motion animation for weeks and weeks, getting it all done. Um, I was working on this one behind the scenes, behind all those other videos. I actually had it done, um, I want to say sometime in September, and then I had to hold off to publish it until October 31st, of course, which is when the target date was. But I was happy to get it done ahead of time. It meant that I didn't have to cram to try to get it done later. And uh, by and large, I, th I think it's awesome. I, I think I think I absolutely nailed the tone I was going for here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't have too much more to say about it. It's, uh, it's really... Um, it's really a thing, isn't it? Isn't it? And I think it holds up really well. You could you could watch it any any Halloween, and it, it's still funny. It's still fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a winner in my books. On to the Chrome Crusher. Just like the Granite Grinder, I feel like this is another really strong video uh, on the channel here. Uh, just everything was working really well at, at this time. Um, 
I, I remember running into a few issues with the editing software that was causing me to have to concede a little bit on some of my uh, creative choices. I know during uh, a few of these scenes here, I originally had them dynamic uh, with dynamic zoom in them as well too to try to keep it a little bit more interesting. But for whatever reason, the program wasn't behaving well. And so I had to do away with some of the editing, uh, editing choices that I would have liked to have done here. So that's unfortunate, but I still feel like the video holds up quite well. Um, some of these photos I still use all the time. Uh, just because I love the colors in them. I, I love some of the, the shots I was able to create for this for this video here. Going through and starting to introduce the idea of like rare parts and set exclusive, uh, that, that all kind of took hold and really started to cement itself um, by this point in time. I know even all the way back in the Hover Scout video, I was already trying to point out set exclusive parts, um, but here it started to become a little bit more systematized. So I was able to um, kind of keep going with it and really go through the brick link uh, list to try to pull out, okay, this was set exclusive, that one was rare, and I remember taking notes on cue cards and whatnot, so I had those cue cards uh, handy to, to help inform uh, my script. I get asked this question all the time, but there's a single frame from the Giant Zoo video, and folks always ask, what, what's going on? Why is it there? Is that an editing mistake? Uh, the whole reason I, I snuck it in there is because I was in the middle of saying the word giant drilling vehicle, right? So giant zoo, giant drilling vehicle. I don't know. I thought it was funny, but I know it, it, it has served as confusion <laughs> to some folks here. As far as set modifications go, I feel like the Chrome Crusher was one of the best ones I came up with, I think. I really, really enjoy the interior of the of the, of the the roll cage, like the, the cockpit there. The interior design is really great there. And I feel like just the small, subtle changes I made throughout the exterior of the body really added a lot to the overall vehicle. These days, I mostly just use stock models. I don't do many modifications anymore, but I know it is something that a lot of folks have asked me to keep doing. So I'll keep it. I'll keep it in mind as, uh, going forward. That robot too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Azareth and I uh, went back and forth, back and forth on the design for that, and uh, trying to analyze it from the commercial and then from the the high quality scan that Xanthera was able to provide. Um, or the highest quality scan we had available, I guess, right? And so we came up with the best we could. <laughs> that was that. Uh, but that took so long. It took forever. Here we come to the tunnel transport. And this is probably the set that I have changed my opinion on the most. Um, out of all the original Rock Raider sets. I know in the video I came across perhaps overly negative towards the set, um, but you know, since then I've, I've come around to the original stock design um, a lot more. The, I, 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 think, I think sometimes I'm misinterpreted as not liking some of the large sets, <laughs> um, but I, from, from my perspective, I feel like the more pieces a set has, the bigger the price, uh, the bigger the budget uh, for the set, the more it should be able to do, right? So the shortcomings become more and more glaring or more and more heinous uh, if the set is bigger, right? So when something like the tunnel transport doesn't exactly live up to my expectations or to what what I want from the set, um, then it, it's 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 hard to give it a pass, I suppose. The same way I can give something like the Rapid Rider a pass, like oh, you know, of course it's not a perfect set, it's less than thirty pieces, right? <laughs> that, that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, with the tunnel transport, I feel like I might have raked it through the coals a little bit, but uh, that's that's all right, I guess. There's a pretty egregious error in this video where I claim that part 4070 was available in Dark Turquoise in the Kabaya sets. Um, it wasn't. I don't know. I don't know why I thought it was. Um, so yeah. It is set exclusive to the tunnel transport <laughs> and continues to be very expensive to this day, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the tunnel transport's a weird set. There's, there's a lot of set exclusive parts in it and um, that's just kind of strange. 
I, I really do stand by my opinion of it feeling half finished though, like like half baked. It's uh, it's not quite as complete feeling compared to the other Rock Raiders sets, in my opinion. Um, so this is, this is one that I don't recommend right out of the gate if you're new to Rock Raiders, um, but I'll talk about that more in a future video. One thing that pleasantly surprised me in this video was the alternate builds. I did not expect them to be as good as they are. And uh, after the horrible, <laughs> horrible experience of the Chrome Crusher alternate builds, I was dreading these ones so much. Um, but in fact, some of them wound up becoming some of my favorites from the entire series. So. Ah, uh, fancy that, you know, thing, things happen, I guess. <laughs> to this day, I am still somewhat shocked how popular the LMS Explorer video is on my channel. <laughs> I, I, I don't quite get it. I don't know where the search traffic comes from. It's, it's not a Rock Raider set and yet uh, it, it gets uh, quite a few views and it did back then too. I remember being very surprised uh, that it really kind of took off and then just kind of had its own legs uh, as, as it went along. So that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, I think it's a good video. Um, it, it's definitely one that from my perspective was marred by tons of technical difficulties. I remember trying to render this thing 10 or 12 different times um, and the program that I was using just fussing about this or that or whatever it was, right? So I, it, it's funny how technical issues like that can really negatively impact your opinion of your own work as a creator, but this is definitely one that uh, I can't I can't quite separate in my mind. A big thank you, of course, to Arthurial for uh, allowing me to interview them and talk about their models in this video here. Um, they're very knowledgeable and they've been an outstanding member of the Rock Creators community for a long time now. Building this uh, 1 to 16 model here was, it was arduous, I won't lie. It, it, it was a real chore uh, that probably took me close to 30 hours if I had to guess how long it took to acquire all the pieces and put it together just using the studio model as reference. Uh, it, it wasn't easy, it was very tough. And now I'm seeing photos of folks that have done the 1 to 8 scale model. That to me is insane. I can't even imagine the amount of work and dedication going into that. So uh, hats off to them, very nice. The size comparison stuff at the end of this video, it, it's both my favorite part and my least favorite part because it was the it, it was this stuff that the software had so much difficulty with and I don't know why even to this day, it was, it was just fighting me on this. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. I think it's cool to see the LMS Explorer compared to real world buildings and using that to allow us to um, to envision what it would look like if it was just floating up in the sky above us. Uh, very cool, very cool stuff. Dark Turquoise back in style has always confused me. <laughs> in my mind, this is a very general appeal sort of video, um, which is pretty rare on my channel. Just a video that talks about a Lego color. And I was always surprised how this one never really took off the way I thought it might. Um, because as I was making it, I was thinking like, oh, you know, this, this isn't exactly as niche as it could be. Um, I, I wanted to make the video, but obviously at this point in time, I was really only geared towards making very niche topic videos. And this one to me was just, ah, it's overly broad. You know, anyone could make this, right? That, that sort of thing. And so I was always confused why the LMS Explorer video was so popular compared to this one, which in my mind seemed like a very general topic, um, but yet never quite reached those highs. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Not necessarily disappointing, but interesting nonetheless. Despite its short runtime, I think I packed a lot of good content into this video. It, it holds up well, in my opinion. Um, it's just maybe not exactly what people come to the channel looking for, so there you go. I think quite notably though, this was the first time you could tell I was spending time on a thumbnail, really trying to you know, put energy and thought into the visual presentation of the video before you even click on it. And that's going to be a trend that we'll see continue the next time we talk about a Lego color. 
what do I say about the tragedy of Darth Slugger the Wise? <laughs> that hasn't been said already. <laughs> <laughs> this was a this was a strange video. Yeah, yeah, uh, but a lot of fun and um, I, I think it was <laughs> some somewhat uh, Somewhat of a detour from what we had experienced already it, it very much plays to the same sort of humor that the Giant zoo video did as well. So um, it's definitely a different side of, of sluggers channel here. Yeah, but, but wow, this came out in January of 2022, and I still haven't made Alpha Team videos yet, so <laughs> just goes to show, my goodness, I'm, I'm so behind in, in, the, uh, in the catalog. Um, I'll try to get them out when I can here, yeah, yeah, and I, I've got plans, I've got all the sets, I, I've got everything lined up, it's just, there's only so much slugger to go around, right, so uh, I'm trying to finish up uh, a lot of other series at the moment, so we'll, we'll get to Alpha Team. We'll get there. We'll get there. I, I even have the uh, the song composed, the uh, the music that I want for the for the um, for the videos. Uh, it's composed in my head, <laughs> and I I can hum you the whole thing, but uh, I, I don't have anything on paper yet or anything recorded yet. So I'll get around to it. I'll get there. One thing I failed to do in the video here was define what UCS stands for. Uh, that's Ultimate Collector Series. It's a Star Wars theme, basically very expensive sets um, that are aimed towards collectors. And a lot of them retroactively have been added to the UCS line, such as the Darth Maul uh, bust. Going forward, I, I remember um, trying to define acronyms a little bit better um, because I didn't want to just assume everyone knew what the acronyms meant. The very first update video, um, and uh, th this was my attempt to just kind of communicate with the growing audience. Uh, and as we can see in in this uh, video here, the the audience sure was growing, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, th those were the days. Those were the days, right? So all up until this point, all these videos we've seen so far, was uh, they were all made with less than 100 subscribers. Is isn't that wild to think about? Very, very, very different era uh, for Slugger's channel. <laughs> Um, one thing that I, I've continued to do with these update videos that has gone uncommented on <laughs> Entirely, I think. I don't think I've ever seen a comment for, for referring to this. Is that at the start of every uh, update video, I present today's topic, and it's always something completely outlandish that has nothing to do with the rest of the video. Um, just because I thought it was funny. <laughs> yep, just because I thought it was funny. Galador. Here we are. <laughs> the 20th anniversary retrospective. This was a uh, video that took a ton of work. I, I think that goes without saying. So many new photos had to be taken in order to prepare for this. So I uh, went through and I was spending a lot of time uh, behind the scenes working on it. There wasn't much in the way of stop motion animation because it's kind of tough to animate the ratchet joints of the Galador figures. I tried my best here and there, but uh, otherwise I was mostly just focused on getting the facts right and getting the um, photos done. This is an example of a video where I actually had to go back and redraft the script and remake the video more or less um, after I had a first screening to my to my friends and family and uh, they gave me some pointers and whatnot. I basically the first draft of this of this script left out all the backstory of Galador. I basically just kind of went into the video and assumed you knew about Galador and then just talked about the figures and stuff. Um, but the feedback I received was that the video would be a lot stronger if it s solidified the history of the theme first before going into that. Uh, so I went back and, and remade it. From, from there. I was able to keep most of the content, but I think the original runtime was about eight minutes long, and uh, looking at it now, it's about 13, so you can see how much of a substantial um, amendment it needed. I'd love to go back and make some more Galador content on the channel here. It's just kind of tough to come up with new things to talk about all the time when it, when it comes to this theme. Um, but the toys are fantastic. Uh, I still stand by pretty much everything I say in this video here. 
um, about them being superior to Bionicle in many regards, superior to System in many regards as well too. Um, they're just fantastic toys, fantastic action figures. And the joint system that they pioneered has stuck around. And I think that shows the longevity and the forethought behind the design. I've never been able to track down a Mokar for myself, but I have tracked down a Mokar owner and talked to them about theirs. Um, they're not looking to sell, unfortunately, <laughs> so my offer still stands. But uh, I don't think anything would be cooler than having a prototype Nick riding a prototype Mokar, so, you know. Overall, this video is very different than my normal fare, but I also feel like it's very good. I, I think I think I hit the target pretty pretty dead on with this one. Uh, so if you haven't seen it already, you might want to go check it out. Here we go, Rock Raiders HQ. This was the big one. This one had to be an event, and as such, it's definitely uh, one of the longest videos on my channel, as well as one of the ones that required the most behind-the-scenes work as well. So, I had to put this one off until it was quite done, uh, because I, I needed to get the Galador one out on February 9th, um, just to coincide with the 20th anniversary. So unfortunately, I wasn't quite able to keep that promise I, I had to myself of trying to get all the Rock Raiders retail sets done before talking about other themes, um, but c'est la vie. I talk about a ton of topics in this video here. Um, we, we dissect the rock monsters, we, we take a look at uh, Rock Raiders HQ, all the different buildings in it. Uh, one thing I'll maybe correct here is that um, in the video I claim that the old mold of the monorail stanchions was never used to uh, facilitate plates being placed on top of it once it was remodeled into the new mold. Uh, but that's wrong actually. I, I didn't realize it, but the, the blockade runner, the original blockade runner uses plates on top of it, which is probably why they changed the mold. Um, and I, as far as I know, that's the only instance of the new mold being used to facilitate plates being on top of it. So there you go, the more you know. The alt builds for the Rock Raiders HQ were a lot of fun too. I remember building these ones up. Um, they take up a lot of space and I definitely got many aspects of them wrong up upon uh, retrospect, but that's okay, that's okay. The whole point here is that we're going through and we're just experimenting with this sort of stuff. It's fun just to take on the challenge, even if you don't hit it 100%. I think one of the most successful decisions I made in this video was going through and showing off the color schemes of these other LEGO Space series uh, reduced to single bricks like this. I got a lot of comments from folks saying that that was a really eye-opening perspective to share, and I, I still think it's a good way to look at them as well too. It helps us compare and contrast what is important in a color palette. Uh, in addition to the color distribution, the colors that are being chosen, both as the primary colors and the accent colors, matter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of sad to see this, uh, this image here and how out of date it has become. Overall, I think I did the Rock Raiders HQ justice in this video. I'm pretty proud of this one. I think it's good. And then, as if to prove to the world that we're not done with Rock Raiders yet, here come the mini heroes. So with this video here, I wanted to follow it up. Um, very quickly with the Kabaya sets as well. And I was actually producing both videos at the same time, just like I did with the Granite Grinder and the Loader Dozer. Uh, at the start here, we can see I define the acronym CMF. I learned from my mistakes with UCS, of course. So, <laughs> growth, yay growth. Overall, I think this was a good video as well. It goes through and identifies all the differences uh, with the minifigure designs in the sets here compared to their original retail releases, and hopefully does justice to the idea that you don't necessarily need to collect everything from a LEGO theme, right? So Chief is not worth it. That's the big topic of discussion here in this video. Chief just, um, it's too expensive. And since creating this video, Chief has more than doubled in price as well. So if Chief wasn't worth it before, you can only guess what my opinions are now. 
I think the discussion surrounding the chief minifigure in this video was the first time I had one of these tough talk sort of moments on the channel. <laughs> uh, and you know what, looking back, I think I, I, think I handled it well. I, I, I think it holds up still. And um, it, it foreshadows some of the other discussions that we would have later on. Um, most of the time, we're we're upbeat and positive here on on the on the channel, right? Um, we're we're basking in in older Lego sets, but sometimes I just feel it's necessary to um, have to remark on these sorts of things. You can't just ignore the context surrounding certain items in Lego. So the context in this case is is uh, is king, right? It it really matters for Chief. Next up are the Kabaya sets, and holy moly, I was very surprised at how good these little sets are. I, I hope that came through in the video, um, but building them, and especially the combiner models, the alternate builds, that was so much fun. <laughs> that, that was wickedly fun, and uh, really insightful. Some of the models were surely subpar, there's no doubt about that, but by and large, the engineering on display here really blew me away. The idea of being able to make so many combiner models and have no leftover parts, um, kind of, kind of mind-boggling, honestly. I don't know who designed the Kabaya sets, but uh, they were on a totally other plane, I think. Unfortunately, I thought I had all of the alternate builds lined up for the Kabaya models. I missed a few. I did. I did. I I'm still coming to terms with that, but he he here's what they look like. Um, so one day there's going to be a, a part two to this, <laughs> to this little adventure here, uh, because there's more. <laughs> there's just more of them. I don't understand why there's so many alternate builds for these Kabaya sets, but there's more. There's more. There's more. Towards the end of the video here, I, I think this is the first instance of me doing this on the channel, but I... I tease the idea of a new video by using its thumbnail in a uh, current video, right? So this is the uh, top 10 alternate builds, a video that hasn't been released yet. I don't even think I had it finished at this point in time, but I had finished the thumbnail. <laughs> and so I uh, kind of just sprinkle that in as a teaser. And I do that from time to time. Oftentimes I make my thumbnails well in advance. And so I can, I can kind of sprinkle them in here or there. So if you've ever seen what looks like a thumbnail to a video and there hasn't been a video yet uh, that corresponds with that thumbnail this is probably why uh, you're probably you're probably seeing something being teased that just hasn't entered production but speaking of alternate builds here we are <laughs> The opening shot here took a lot of work and uh, Emerald had to help me out with it quite a bit here to get it all rendered uh, properly with all the alternate builds poking their heads through here. Um, this video itself had to be run at, I believe it was 60 frames per second, maybe 30 frames per second to make it smooth, to make this, this transition smooth. Prior to this, almost all of my videos were 18 frames per second because that's what I stop motion animate at. Um, but this was the first one to kind of buck that trend. And so the stop motion in this video is still done at 18 frames per second, but the um, the pan, that, that slow pan down, needed a faster frame rate to not look choppy and stuttery. This is my first and uh, to this to this date at least only top 10 list on the YouTube channel. <laughs> so I kind of see that as like uh, as a bingo space or something, right? You got you got to do a top 10 video at some point in time, right? Otherwise, it's, it's just not a YouTube channel. You got to have a top 10 video. <laughs> Other than that, I don't really have much to say about this one. I think it's enjoyable, I, I think it's good, and um, I haven't really changed my opinions on any of them, so I think it holds up. The Rock Monster Truck. This was the start of something, uh, something big I didn't even realize at the time. But um, for myself, I just thought this was a little look at what I thought was a um, one-off sort of mention to Rock Raiders um, by a designer by the name of Marin Stipkovic. 
And uh, so I went down to my local Toys R Us, bought up a trio of these, and um, started building with them, had some fun, made a quick little video about it, and that was that. Little did I know that uh, Marin would later watch the video, reach out to me, and um, ever since then we've been fans of each other's work and have uh, communicated uh, about Lego and all those sorts of things as well. Um, so it, it's it's been really rewarding, and um, I have the Rock Monster Truck to thank for that. The video itself is a lot of fun, it was fun to make, and the large monster truck <laughs> model I still have to this day, I never, I never disassembled it, so it's still out there, uh, yeah. <laughs> All around uh, cool set. It, it was it was uh, it was a really cool experience to make this one. Speaking of fun experiences, here we have Lego Rock Raiders: The Secret Video Game. This was the first April first special, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I'm not much of a holiday person myself. I don't really I don't really care about the holidays. They're just they're just days on a calendar, and the calendar is just a way of you know aligning dates um, that really have no bearing on time and space but for the fun of it you know sometimes I like to indulge so uh, with the Halloween videos and the April 1st videos um, they, these are good good occasions I think to have fun right so with this one the premise bounced around for a while I had several different ideas that of what I wanted to do for April 1st some of them involved um, Rock Raiders some of them involved other Lego themes but in the end, this was the one that seemed the most actionable. Just to have some fun and try to tease the, the viewer here, I decided to uh, make Evil Nick, the prototype uh, Galador figure that I had or that I owned at the time but hadn't made public. I decided to make them my uh, desktop background to see if anyone noticed. Um, no one noticed, <laughs> which is fine, which is fine. But uh, yeah, it was kind of fun to do that. And actually to this day, that image is still my desktop background. <laughs> I think it's a great photo. I, I think it looks awesome. Evil Nick is a great design. I haven't really commented on it too much yet, but um, throughout these videos we're starting to see new Slugger artwork pop up from time to time. So here we have the Slug Cam, right? <laughs> and uh, in the Galador video we had uh, Slugger glinching a Yen's arm on uh, onto him as well there too. Uh, yeah, so Brett was really hitting it out of the park with these, um, with these uh, new updates to the Slug art. Speaking of Brett, uh, he really helped me out with an additional video that uh, is uh, hiding somewhere in plain sight. Slugger update number two. This is a bit more of a follow-up video to previous ones. Basically, it's it's what I'm doing right now, talking about these videos, um, but it was done back then as well too. Um, I'm a big fan of Ross Scott and Accursed Farms, and I know this is something he's done with his um, Ross's Game Dungeon uh, series, so I was trying to replicate some of that here. Um, I, I don't know, it might be something that I look at doing in the future, but it, I, so far it hasn't really um, taken hold in my mind all that much. I don't have too much more to say about it, other than I really do need to get around to making that Fabuland video at some point. All right, here we go. This is the turning point for the Slugger channel. For whatever reason, YouTube decided that everybody needed to see this video. This was the video everyone needed to see. <laughs> And um, I, I really, uh, I really wish uh, the algorithm would have chosen another video rather than this one. <laughs> this is uh, this is a really niche topic. Um, if I had any say over which which videos got popular, this would not be in my top choices at all. This would be near the bottom, I think. <laughs> um, it, it it really taught me that. Um, I guess the average Lego fan isn't as into Lego as I am, <laughs> or as other people. Other people watch the channel as well too, right? And I guess that, like that's obvious, right? <laughs> like it should be obvious, but up until that point, it, it, it wasn't for me. So I was going into this video with the intention, with the expectation that folks that would watch this video had seen at least a few of my other videos, right? This was not something geared towards a general audience. Uh, with this video and that in the discussion of it so when it took off and now all of a sudden this was the first video 
that folks had seen of mine, um, I think it bewildered many and and put them off quite a, quite a bit uh, as to how uh, how engaged I was with with this topic or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I received a lot of strange comments and um, obviously positive ones too, but but um, a lot of misinformation and, and folks coming into it. Uh, from all walks of life, right? So <laughs> even something as innocuous as, as me saying they retired brown because, you know, brown, the color has been retired um, for decades now, <laughs> almost, right? Uh, folks would be like, what? No, they didn't retire brown. There's brown in Lego sets all the time. And then I have to point out, well, that's reddish brown. That's actually the newer shade of the color, right? So uh, it's just one of those things where like, if, if that's where we're, we're, you know, where the discussion's happening, how are we going to talk about the rest of the, this video like like there, there was such a small overlap in the Venn diagram of understanding um, you know be, between um, the, the creator here and and some of some of the folks watching the video um, and that's just because it blew up right so as it stands today it, it's it's over a hundred and eighty thousand views one of my most viewed videos ever if not the most viewed video ever and I just feel like this is such a poor video to have <laughs> taken off like that. <laughs> Um, so again, this is this is one of those videos that outside influence has impacted my perception of it. So now, looking back at this video, uh, it, it's one of those ones like, wow, I wish I didn't make that video. <laughs> like, even though I think the video itself is good, like, and, and, and it goes through uh, the topic well and um, describes an issue that other people have um, also c confided in me about as well too about trans neon orange changing its its hue over time, and I think we've nailed down that time period to be about 2005 is when that change happened. So parts prior to 2005 um, are in the original shade of the color, and parts afterwards are in this new kind of more muted greenish hue. So that can help inform some purchase decisions, I think. Uh, overall, like, I, think, I think the video is fine, and it probably accurately predicted the future um, for trans neon green. I knew it back then. I really did. Even, even in the video, I, I do try to say that, like, oh, maybe there's hope. You know, trans bright green is, you know, it, it's different enough, right? Maybe there's hope. Um, but I knew it. I, I knew there was... the. the the writing was on the wall here, right? So uh, that's why later on, when we get to that trans neon green video, I, I say it up front. It's like, we, we knew this was coming, right? Like deep, deep down, we all knew this, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So anyways, this is just such a, such a niche video. And it's strange to me that YouTube decided that this was the one. But there are a number of people here probably watching this video, uh, listening to me talk right now, where this was their jumping on point for the Slugger channel. And that's cool. If, if, if this video brought you here and you've got fond memories of it, that's awesome. That's awesome. It, it was just for me the very first time I had to come face to face with uh, a more general audience that maybe didn't share the same values as I did. And so that was reflected in the comments as well too. A um, lot, lot, of, lot of rude stuff going on in there. Not the majority though, obviously not the majority. So I'm still very thankful for, for folks that stuck around or continue to stick around and leave comments on my videos. Even if they are sometimes abrasive, that's fine. I can take it. It's all good. It's all good. Time Cruisers. With Rock Raiders mostly in the rear view mirror, I was able to focus on the next series I wanted to tackle. And I chose a doozy for this one here. <laughs> Time Cruisers, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. I really didn't own any Time Cruisers growing up. The only set I had was the Rocket Racer set. And so all of the Time Cruiser sets prior or um, past that one, I acquired as an adult. So this is not a childhood favorite theme of mine, the same way Rock Raiders might have been, but at the same time, it's one that deserves love. I think it deserves so much of our affection for what it did as a theme, how successful it was with its play features, and how creative it was with its imaginative storytelling. I love the idea of having a host of characters that travel between your Lego themes that you as a child own, you as an adult own, right? You can have 
Dr. Cyber pop up in Rock Raiders. Dr. Cyber can pop up over here. You can go over there. Timmy can pop up here. It, it, it's so much fun. I love it. I love it. it it's it's perhaps Lego's very first meta theme. Like it, it, it exists beyond the fourth wall. And I, th I think that's just so much fun. It, it's such a great idea. So one thing I point out in this video, and I, I do it pretty early on, is I point out that Rock Raiders had a pre-installed fan base. Rock Raiders um, was easy to talk about. It was it was something that I could build a channel based on. I would not be where I am today had I started with Time Cruisers. It's it's just a fact, right? Time Cruisers is is not well loved the same way Rock Raiders is. Hopefully, my videos and uh, general discourse has helped change that to some extent. Hopefully, there's more positivity surrounding the theme. And I've heard from so many people in the comment section uh, in these videos in this series here that say they never really thought twice about time cruisers but you know i watched your video and i checked it out and i really like the sets you know that sort of stuff it's great to hear that it's really awesome to hear that so hopefully much of the ire that has been directed towards this theme as being made of leftover pieces or being just generally ugly and, and just terrible sets it's it's all stuff that's been spewed by people that have never played with these sets. They've never built these sets. They don't know what they're talking about, right? Like, it's okay to have a negative opinion, but it's got to be an informed negative opinion. That's what matters at the end of the day. And I found that with Galador as well, too. It's tough to talk uh, nice about Galador without people jumping down your throat or just saying Galador sucks, right? <laughs> Time Cruiser sucks. Galador sucks, right? Uh, th these are people that don't know. They, they just don't have the experience with these themes, right? It's okay to say that I think that set looks bad, right? But we have to be able to back that up and subjectify it by saying it's our opinion, right? Uh, so I think that's that's another important facet in online discourse and just another uh, cornerstone of what I try to c communicate on my channel. Overall, I think the primer episode, this idea of having a starting point to then dive into the series later, was a really smart decision on my part here. It allows me to say a bunch of things up front that I don't have to try to bake into the first episode while still trying to talk about a set. If you could imagine all the ground I cover in this video also mixed with the Rocket Racer episode, I, I just don't think it would work. It, they would distract from each other. It, you know, that'd be subtraction through addition. So in this case, I think it made more sense to keep them separate. And it's a trend I will continue to do going forward. I already have done this primer episode idea with Orient Expedition, but with any new series afterwards, I am going to have a primer episode um, to get things started. I think it just makes sense to do it this way. Another quick note here, um, the the city, the future city in 3777 and the Ministry of Past and Future, I had so much fun building these and animating them. It, it's just, it, t it tickles a part of my brain that is, is just so much fun. <laughs> uh, really reminded me of like the set designers on Logan's Run, like that, that old uh, science fiction movie where they built the giant future city and all that sort of stuff. I, I felt like I was in a small way tapping into that a little bit. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to any, any times, any opportunities I get to do something like that. The other thing that was really important to me was pointing out both of these two videos at the end here. The uh, Time Losers video and the Time Cruisers video by Pants a Hat, right? Um, they are just such uh, fundamental pieces of internet lore when it comes to Time Cruisers, uh, which is kind of a weird thing to, to think about, but uh, I, I feel like you, you have to see them, right? <laughs> How could you enjoy time cruisers and not watch those videos? Even if you don't like them at the end of the day, right? That That's fine. But like, I don't know. They're very substantial to me, right? So I wanted to make sure that in the primer episode, I mention them. I say, go watch them, right? They are really good. And I'm going to I'm gonna test you on them later to make sure you've, you've watched them. <laughs> so that, that was kind of fun. And you know what? Both of the creators of those videos uh, have, have reached out to me uh, and uh, watched watch my videos now too which, which is fun that, that that's so so much fun um because i'm i'm obviously fans of their work and uh i think i think now the, the feeling's mutual and and that's rewarding that's rewarding as a video creator the last thing I'll mention here is the physical mock-up here at the end. Um, so obviously I wasn't going to do, do the same artwork with the you know caution tape and the moving 
tools and stuff like that uh, as I did with Rock Raiders. I wanted something new for time cruisers. And so what I decided on was creating a time machine, like a time vortex here, having the hypno disc spinning in the middle there, and then having the time cruiser or time twisterified slugger pop up and, uh, and coming up with the slogan. It took a little while to find this slogan, time flies when you're having fun, right? And uh, it, was, it was from one of the commercials um, surrounding the theme at the time. It was really tough to, to find like a catchphrase for it because Rock Raiders, it was easy. It was, it was high adventure, deep underground. That was the catchphrase for the theme, right? So I just use that. Uh, it's easy. <laughs> uh, but with Time Flies, when you're having fun, it's a little bit more generic, but I, I feel like it, it, it reflects the series well. It, and sometimes, and I get this comment sometimes on my videos where folks um, say that I can't believe the video's over, right? I looked up and it, it's over, right? <laughs> it's a long video, but yet, you know, it feels like it was 30 seconds. Um, I, th I think it, it goes to show that um, with, with proper editing and pacing and, and fun topics, passion, all these sorts of things, you add them all together, you get a really great video experience out of that. And uh, I encourage other uh, creators to, to do the same as well, right? To take, take that mantra and, and run with it. Previously on RR Slugger's Time Cruisers Retrospective. <laughs> I had my partner um, record the voice line for that, and I, I love her for it. it, it it's, it's so funny. It, it cracks me up every single time I hear it, because I always forget that it's there whenever I go back and watch this episode. <laughs> uh, it's just so much fun. Um, yeah, so th this is the first proper episode of Time Cruisers. And I'm diving into the very first set here, Rocket Racer. No, not that Rocket Racer, not that Rocket Racer either. It's this Rocket Racer, right? So, <laughs> this is the original one. This is the original Rocket Racer. And it's an odd little set. It's a fun little set. Um, probably the weakest of the Time Cruisers offering, I'd say, though. I hope the idea of a test didn't come off uh, condescendingly. That that wasn't my intent here. Uh, I just thought I thought it would be fun. I had some fun with it here. Um, yeah, hopefully folks enjoyed it as well too. Going back and trying to test their knowledge on it, and uh, uh, going through the multiple choice here. A lot of these images that I took for the multiple choice, especially the ones of Dr. Cyber holding the clock and 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 whatnot there, uh, those appear a lot in future videos. So that uh, I got a lot of mileage out, out of uh, some of the stuff from that segment, as well as the song that I wrote for it too, uh, Time for Mystery. Yeah. In Time Cruisers, we start to see a transition away from stop motion animation in favor of video clips. There, there still is some stop motion in, in these episodes, of course, but I actually felt that stop motion detracts from the appeal of these sets. It's very easy to make things animate and move around in stop motion animation. That's why we do it, right? That's why we do stop motion animation is to make things that are inanimate move. But these sets aren't inanimate. They are moving, like they, they have motion to them. There's um, kinetic energy behind them. And I think it, it makes more sense to show that off with a video clip of the set actually in, in motion uh, rather than doing it through stop motion because through stop motion, it kind of tricks the brain into thinking that like, oh, you know, I guess this is just, um, you know, it's just fake. This is, <laughs> it isn't real. <laughs> um, whereas with, with a video clip of you see the hands, they grab the set, they move it across the table. That really illustrates to the viewer that, oh wow, it does it on its own. That's cool, right? And so that's why I started making that transition there. It wasn't, it wasn't a transition out of like lazy of like, uh, you know, uh, instead of stop motion animating this, I'll just push it across the table and I get the same result. It was a conscious decision um, that pushing it across the table communicated something that stop motion didn't. So that's that was the reason behind that. And it became something of a growing trend um, throughout the series. This video is also the first time I got to rip on Explorians a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Explorians more in a future video at some point. Uh, I have all the sets from Explorians, and some of them are good. Um, and I really like what the series is about. I like the aesthetics of the series, but I don't know, the build, the build quality, the construction? I don't know, I don't know. 
Um, yeah, it was just something I, I had read online all the time too. People complaining about their time cruiser sets falling apart. Um, I just it, that was not my experience at all. And in fact, it was I felt it was far more true about other contemporary themes. So I used Explorians as an example there, because um, my Explorian sets, mm, yeah, they're pretty flimsy. <laughs> Whereas Time Cruise is pretty rock steady, honestly, honestly. And from the amount of play that I, I have had from these sets, now granted, I was an adult playing with them, right? So maybe as a kid, if I was really rough with them, I would have uh, found that they would break apart or the play features would stop working. But nonetheless, I don't know. I don't know, I felt like um, Time Cruisers came out the victor between those two series. So here we go, the 1012 subscriber special. It's been over a year since I produced this video and I have tried ever since to make a video as good as this one. <laughs> um, yeah. In terms of in terms of viewership here, uh, if you haven't seen the 1012 subscriber special, please, please go watch it. <laughs> um, because I feel like you're missing the best video I've ever made. <laughs> At least in my opinion, this, this is this is on the top of the podium, I think, uh, for me. I go back and watch this one uh, almost monthly, um, just because I, I, I love it so much. Um, it was created under the gun. And um, I had to really, really hustle to get this one out the door. I, I remember publishing the video, watching the view count go up. And I was still like, like I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I'm still doing my job at this time too. And I had about <laughs> 72 hours maybe total uh, between, um, you know, eating, sleeping, teaching, and then also working on this in the background in order to get it out in time. Um, and I remember being at work just before I started uh, teaching and publishing the video from uh, my iPad <laughs> because I noticed that the subscriber count had finally hit 1,012. So I hit publish and then went about my day teaching. And then afterwards went through and uh, commented uh, or um, followed up with the comments and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so anyways, th this is about Model Team, which is a series that I have a lot of fondness for. And this is all as an adult collector. I never owned any Model Team sets growing up, um, but it, it's fascinating stuff. And it, it's it's really well designed uh, and it uses old parts in interesting ways. So it, it's checking all the boxes off for me in that regard here. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't anticipate ever collecting all the Model Team sets because it does get repetitive. There's only so many many times I want to build a semi truck in my life, right? So um, having having the one here is fine. You know, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy with that. Um, they did make some other cool ones though. So you never know if I, if I find more in the future, I'll go for it. Um, but yeah, th this was a big step forward, I think uh, for me and uh, my channel in terms of video creation. It's a far funnier video than most of my videos are. And um, I like to think of myself as a fun, funny person as well <laughs> in my in my day to day. I don't know, I don't think that comes across all that well in my videos because they are so scripted and there's very few chances for uh, comedy in that regard. Um, but as, as a teacher, that is my chief tool. If you're the funniest person in the room, uh, you earn the respect of everybody. <laughs> and so that's classroom management in a nutshell there. Be funny, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, beyond that here, I think there was a ton of uh, fun photography and uh, fun experiences here through the suffering, because there was also suffering as well. <laughs> but this was a, uh, an every waking moment sort of video. Uh, every waking moment I was working on this video between um, eating and you know going to my job and whatnot uh, and then I'd come home and I'd work on this video <laughs> and I'm really happy with the results um, it, it's honestly kind of shocking to me that I was able to make something as as good as I did here given the time constraints surrounding it but all of this was made possible by that um, retiring the Rock Raiders color the trans neon orange video because that video blew up this video exists. I thought I had way more time to make this video, but I was wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> it all came so fast. It, it, was, it was really, really crazy. Here we go. We finally made it to Slugger's first birthday. This should be about the halfway point. <laughs> I might have to speed this up a bit here because I'm checking the runtime and I don't know. I didn't anticipate this to uh, be a, um, a uh, 
four hour excursion. So um, I might have to speed things up. Uh, this is another video that is, uh, in my opinion, criminally underviewed on my channel. Um, there, there are so many people that ask me these questions that I answer in this video uh, that I just feel like everyone needs to see this one. So between the 1012 subscriber special and the first birthday episode, if you haven't seen either one of these, please do yourself the favor. Go, go watch them. Go check them out. Um, to me, they stand as high points for my content. I don't have too much more to say about it other than just recapping what the video says. Um, so yeah, just, just go watch it, I think. Um, you get a ton of behind the scenes content and there might even be a secret video linked in the description for you to check out. How to build the tool store from LEGO Rock Raiders. This is the first foray into building all of the in-game models from the game. So. This was maybe a stumble out of the gates sort of thing for me. <laughs> uh, I know previously I've talked about some mistakes I've made in some videos, um, but prior to this one, they were all kind of minor things. This was a probably pretty big major mistake, um, a lot of the stuff in this video. Basically, I, uh, I came across a, a model. Um, I think this was the one that was used in Manic Miners at the time of the tool store and just kind of took it at face value. I was like, all right, this is how you build the tool store. And I just copied the model, put it in the video here and just went about my day, right? <laughs> um, a lot of the, the stuff that I had learned from the how to build uh, the, the slimy slug video was reused here. Uh, such as the step-by-step -step instructions, that sort of stuff. So that's cool. Um, but the build is completely wrong. And there is a follow-up video that was made much later that explains how and why it's it's wrong in, in so many different ways. Um, but this video, in, in a roundabout way, was a good thing because it introduced me to someone by the name of Juniper who has such a strong attention to detail when it comes to designing or reverse engineering these sets, rather. And since then, we've been working together on all of the Rock Raider models since then. I really trust their judgment on this sort of stuff, so um, it, it has been a, a boon, a real boon to uh, the series. And um, yeah, since then we've been working together along with Baraklava and Sadie on getting this sort of stuff all arranged and um, presented properly, right, at the end of the day. So th this was me just kind of uh, getting ahead of myself, I guess, kind of taking things at face value and just making assumptions about it. Um, and. I know sometimes folks look at the video quality uh, on my channel and say everything's like such high quality and all, all this sort of stuff. And it, while I appreciate those those comments and those compliments, um, myself as a person, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a rock and roll musician, right? So uh, at the end of the day, I, you know, if it's close enough for rock and roll, it's close enough for me. I'm not a perfectionist when it, when it comes down to it. Um, so it's useful for me to be surrounded by folks that are a bit more perfectionist in nature than I am. Um, because I'm willing to, you know, just kind of compromise and say, yeah, you know, it's good enough is good enough. It's good. It's good. It's fine, right? Uh, even though I have, you know, high standards for myself, they're not perfect standards, right? <laughs> and so uh, e even, uh, even little mistakes can make it through the door. Um, and sometimes things just aren't as good in these videos as they could be, but I, I can live with it. You know, I'm fine with it. So uh, I, th I think this, this video helped open the door a little bit to being a bit more critical of the stuff I put out. And it, it was good. It was a good learning experience for me. Nonetheless, I feel like there's a lot of good stuff in this video. It's, it's not necessarily an obsolete video, but you do have to watch the follow-up to get the full picture. That's for sure. The 31127 Street Racer. Uh, this was the latest and greatest Marin Stipkovic 3 in 1 uh, for the Creator series. And uh, th this was a fun, a fun model to, to mess around with, a fun set to build with. Um, although, right out of the gate, the one thing that strikes me most about this video is my voice. <laughs> you can tell I was recovering from being sick at the time, and my voice sounds so deep in this video, just really bassy. <laughs> it uh, almost sounds like it, I've uh, artificially modulated it to, to a degree, so uh, that that's kind of eye-opening for me. It's like, wow, wow, you know, that, that virus really did a really did a number on me there. <laughs> yeah. So 
I don't know. This one, this this video, I think I think it's good. I think there's some good stuff in it here. Um, I, I definitely skirt around the set a little bit here uh, and talk about rock raiders quite a bit. So uh, yeah, it's a bit of a Trojan horse episode. Admittedly, I, I decided to uh, you know put in the um, dark turquoise wish list right from the rock raider fans to the potential rock raider developers that, or potential lego developers that are listening uh to the video um because I, I i know there are some some folks out there that uh work at lego that do watch my stuff so you know what i felt like i gotta shoot my shot here we'll, we'll try it out we'll, we'll see what happens um yeah now, in terms of working with the color scheme within uh, the Street Racer, this um, this video shows off the blue and dark turquoise combination that I quite like. Although I, I will say it doesn't photograph especially well. I think it looks better in person than it does uh, on camera here. So I understand if folks are saying like, Ew, what do you mean that looks better? That looks worse. Um, yeah. I, I, I agree in the photos, it's, it's, it's not amazing. I, I really do think there's a lot of potential with uh, fusing blue and dark turquoise together. Um, it's just a color combination I don't see all that often and I'd like to see it more. The Time Tunnelator, the very first of the Time Twisters videos. This one was fun too, and I had to compose a new piece of music for it, um, so that, that was interesting. Slugger's design is actually based on Tony Twister here as well too, so, uh, I mean Slugger's design for this series is, and uh, yeah. I think this is a good video. This is another solid in entry into the series here. It goes through the Time Twisters backstory, talks about them a little bit, um, and kind of I, I hopefully debunks the notion that um, Time Twisters was an upgrade to Time Cruisers. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. It might be true for aesthetics. That, I could see that argument being being true there. Um, but yeah, these are solid sets. These, these are really good sets. Um, with this one, you gotta get rid of that wheel though. Oh my goodness, that rear wheel is just awful. It's just so bad. <laughs> so as long as you're able to do that, uh, this set really excels. It's a really great one. I think having both of the um, plastic peripherals for this video uh, was maybe a bit of a flex on my part, so <laughs> maybe apologies there, but uh, I, I think it, it's, it adds something to, to the videos to have those extra add-ons that were available with the sets at the time. Um, so I do oftentimes go out of my way to try to acquire them just to show them off in the videos. Not necessarily for um, a personal collecting uh, or for personal collecting reasons, but rather just because I feel like it would make the video better. Part two. <laughs> the tragedy of Darth Slugger the Wise uh, needed a sequel. <laughs> I felt, or honestly, it, it wasn't something that was planned. It was something that just came up. <laughs> I was building one of the alternate builds, getting ready to do the series, and then I realized that the box had alternate builds that the instructions didn't have, and therefore I needed to go and track down the boxes too. Um, yeah, this, this was pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty demoralizing to be honest. <laughs> I thought I was in the clear, I thought I was ready to get started, and then I had to put the whole series on pause yet again. So. Yeah, that's, that's why this video exists. Now, th this video came out uh, 10, almost 11 months ago now. So where is the series, Slugger? Like, this is the last that you've heard me basically talk about Alpha Team up until this point. And I'll, I'll be honest, what, what ultimately happened is that I realized Orient Expedition was uh, having its 20th anniversary in 2003, or in 2023, rather. And so I moved that series ahead in the, in this, in the, um, in the slot. Um, I think at this time as well too, I don't think I had the Orient Expedition series yet. I hadn't yet won that eBay auction <laughs> that basically got me the whole series for something like something like 300 bucks. It was so cheap. Um, I can't believe I, I made out with that uh, with that set there, like or that uh, lot, I should say. Uh, anyways, uh, basically Alpha Team had to get pushed back to the to the back burner a little bit so that I could do Orient Expedition first. Um, so that's where it's at at this point in time. I, I do want to get to Alpha Team. It is on my to-do list. I am really looking forward to it when I get there. Um, but there's just a few other series that um, are taking precedent at this time. 
I just wanted to add as well too, I, I, I realize that I can just look at these pictures of these uh, alternate builds online and build them that way. I, I, I know that, I know I can do that. <laughs> um, the reason why I try to track down the boxes though is because I wanna show the boxes in the video and I wanna be able to show off the alternate builds of the boxes in the video. I know that's just me being difficult, but again, it's like the plastic peripherals. I think it makes the video better and so I'm, I'm doing it for the purpose of making the video better. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, as silly as that might sound, uh, that, that, that's why, that's why I collect a lot of these things. Slugger got some sealed vintage Lego sets. <laughs> this is, um, this is, I think to this point in time, my first and only Lego haul video, which is another one of those rite of passages, I think, for Lego content creators on YouTube. Um, I'm not a big fan of making these, and it, it was just kind of serendipitous that this one kind of worked out like that. I had all these different sets come all at the same time, and so I just thought, you know what, I'll just show them off now because I know it's going to be a long time until I talk about any of these, or most of these. And uh, yeah, looking back, even to this day, some of these sets still haven't been opened. I still haven't talked about them on the channel. So um, they, they will be talked about eventually, right? I hope to get around to them. I don't buy them for the sake of holding on to them and reselling them later uh, so I, I plan to open them I plan to build them um, but yeah th this was an interesting opportunity uh, to talk about this I don't do it often and I, I don't really like watching these sort of videos too um, I don't know I feel like I, I come off as rather affluent like oh look what I look what I can buy right with my money <laughs> um, yeah so that that's maybe not not great but hopefully there's enough um, intrigue behind this uh, that makes it at least an interesting viewing experience so now we come to the fear of missing out. This is my first overtly negative video, I would say. Um, and this is not something that was planned out ahead of time. This was not intended as a hit piece on, on Lego <laughs> as a company or whatever. Um, this was a spur of the moment uh, thing of me writing my, my thoughts and my feelings after having to go out and uh, buy a whole bunch of random sets in order to get the one that I wanted. And not really having a strong uh, alternative to do that, other than just don't get it, I guess, right? And um, that, that kind of falls into that unhelpful, if you don't like it, don't buy it sort of camp, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is one that I made uh, within, what was it? I, it was like something like 16 hours. I, I had made the, the video, uh, or sorry, no. So yeah, within the span of 16 hours, I had gone to the Lego store, purchased all the things, came home, built the set, um, started to formulate thoughts about the set, and started writing them down, uh, went to work, worked my worked my uh, my work day came home worked on the video some more went to sleep <laughs> woke up the next morning continued working on the video published the video and went to work again <laughs> so uh, th that 16 hours that I had there uh, was uh, including working and sleeping so <laughs> I, I don't really know how I was able to get through all that in, in that uh, short span of time. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so th this is this is another example of something that is achievable whilst under the gun. Um, yeah, uh, th this video, uh, I, it holds up. I know I've said that a lot during this, this kind of director's commentary of, of my channel, um, but I, I really don't regret much of what I said in this video. And I had a lot of good discussions in the comment section. This is probably one of the highest amounts of, um, I don't know what I want to call that, engagement, I suppose, <laughs> down in the comment section there. Obviously, I'm not making this video as, as a way to garner that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, algorithmic hit of, of engagement, but uh, it, it definitely happened with this one. Lots of discussions, lots of arguments, you know, uh, debates, I would say. Um, and in the end, I, I'll be honest, I don't think there's a lot of good strong defense for the LEGO group uh, on this practice here. I, I think it is just outwardly um, anti-consumer, right? Um, it, it's, it, it, it might appear to be positive, and there are a few folks, a minority, a minority of folks that this actually actively benefits. And um, I liken it to the Defunct Land video about the fast pass. Uh, 
I think I think it's a great comparison to draw. Where the fast pass monster is raging and it's destroying the amusement park, and yet there is a small minority of folks that are friends with the monster, and that's that's what it is here as well too. There is a monster, and then this the, the FOMO monster, whatever you want to call it here, and there is a small minority of folks that are friends with that FOMO monster, and uh, the rest of us have to suffer the the price, and usually the price is really high. <laughs> <laughs> just a huge paywall behind these sets and then the secondary market has them listed at double their retail uh, suggested retail price so what do you do what do you do in this situation right I don't know um, yeah I don't want to dwell on it too much here but uh, yeah I stand by it this, this is a strong video um, in my opinion and uh, I've had a lot of folks um, a lot of other Lego creators uh, either talk to me publicly or privately saying that they really value um, my perspective on that and, and being willing to, to, to say that, right? Sometimes they're in positions that they can't say that without jeopardizing their livelihood and I can respect that as well too, right? So um, I, I think it's important. It deserves to be, it de deserves to be talked about. Slugger update number three. This is a big one because this was the start of monetization on my channel. Um, and uh, that all resulted again <laughs> from that uh, retired trans neon orange video. Uh, that, that really sparked it off and then the continued success of uh, follow-up videos to that um, kept the train rolling on, on the tracks. So yeah. What what happened with all this, right? Like, did did I just hit the magic money button afterwards? <laughs> By and large, the answer is no. You might be surprised how long it took before I actually actively went back and started monetizing old videos. But um, yeah, m money was never a priority for me when when making this uh, this content, th these videos, right? It's just it's just not the motivator um, for the most part, right? Um, now, to say that that hasn't changed over time would be a lie, right? Uh, it, it's it's so hard to walk away from the temptation of earning money. Um, and I, I think that's something that uh, we, if, if you are a content creator, or if, if you're someone that puts effort into this hobby, this, this passion, um, you have to recognize that. And there have been many times where I've gone through, and I'll talk about them in, in maybe some future videos as well too, some of the smaller videos, or the Slugger update videos, for example, where I'm going through the effort of putting the video together, all this sort of stuff, like doing the work behind it, and putting it out, and it would be so easy just to hit the magic make me money button, um, but I, I refuse to do that in a lot of scenarios, because I know that if I lean into that temptation, it's all too easy to just stop making high effort scripted content just make dime a dozen daily videos right where I, I just pull the set out and I handle it on my folding table or whatever right and and then just you know spur of the moment share my thoughts on it and that's my that's my YouTube channel hooray right I did it <laughs> and now I'm making money every single day um, I don't know I don't know right so it, it's it's really easy to to fall into that I think and the platform the YouTube platform encourages you to do that they, they want that consistency and the more videos you upload the more money you make off of those videos as well so the, to, to say that the monetary side of things hasn't impacted me uh, would be completely false. It, it, it's, it absolutely has, it absolutely has. Um, so it, it's something that I had to weigh, I had to weigh my thoughts on it quite a bit before even accepting the monetization um, aspect of things, but yeah. I wasn't at all prepared for the seedy underbelly of YouTube, um, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very much out of the loop when it comes to the internal workings of even how a YouTube channel works and how the monetization system works. I always have, I always have uh, commenters tell me more about this sort of stuff than I know myself, so um, I, I guess I'm just uninformed. I'm, I'm fairly ignorant to this sort of stuff. 
But um, yeah, the revelation that unskippable ads and mid-roll ads especially are decisions that the content creators make they inflict that on you in order to earn more money. Uh, that that was pretty uh, that was pretty earth shattering to me. <laughs> that uh, that shifted my perspective on a lot of things. Um, and so now, whenever I sit through a mid roll ad, I can't help but feel negativity towards the person that made me um, have to watch it. Right. So I I don't know. You know, everyone's got their own opinions on monetization uh, for this sort of content, and um, the, these are my thoughts. Those were my thoughts then, and they've changed since then as well too, right? Um, it it as your experiences evolve, hopefully your opinions evolve as well. And so as as the circumstances, as the situations change, um, the your you know your worldview will 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 change accordingly. Right, so uh, that's something else that I've been uh, considering. It's 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 every, every time I make a new video, I'm I'm thinking about the the monetization aspect of it now too, and um, sometimes you get in in a in a rut of uh, videos that don't rank very high on your uh, list of um, uh, growth, let's say, right, uh, and that can lead you into thoughts of trying to target that growth just making videos compromising the videos that you make in order to gain more traction to gain more money and uh, th th those are kind of negative thoughts to have as a creative person this idea that what I'm making right now, the things that I want to make right now, I shouldn't want to make these things. I should want to make these things instead because these earn me more money. And um, yeah, it, it, th 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 those are those are dark thoughts, I think, uh, as a as a creative, as a content creator. And um, it, yeah, it, it, it taints it taints it in a way uh, that was not tainted beforehand. On the same uh, on the same topic, though, like on the other side of the coin, is that um, it's it's nice to be able to earn at least some means of um, uh, re recuperation, I suppose, when it comes to the investments made in Lego and equipment and all this sort of stuff. It's nice to get like a little bit of a kickback from that, and to do it in a way that doesn't inflict pain on your viewers. <laughs> <laughs> like YouTube's gonna put ads on on my videos no matter what I do, um, so it, it's it's nice to be able to earn some of that money back, I suppose. And I know, I know, and I get I get uh, comments from folks all the time asking about how they can contribute more to the channel because um, they're just looking to you know, support the channel in, in ways. And I keep telling them, just watching the videos is is a great way to support the channel. You don't have to send me money all the time, right? So. Um, that, that that's that's something that I, I think I think is uh, important uh, to, to consider as well too, is how your audience shapes the content that you create, because um, you want to create stuff that they want to watch, and um, you know that 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 helps keep return viewership, which is which is good. But once you start adding money into the whole equation, it, it really does shift your focus. Um, even even someone like myself that does this as a hobby, that does this for fun, uh, money complicates things. It really does. It really does at the end of the day. So I, I don't know. I, I know I'm, I'm rambling at this point here, but it is something that I think about a lot um, when making these videos. Speaking of money, this is my video about the extremely rare LEGO Galador prototype figure that I acquired, Evil Nick. Now, uh, this this was an expensive one, <laughs> to say the least, and this one, to this day, might be the most expensive video I have ever made. Matthew Ewald was so kind to talk to me about this and to share his memories of Evil Nick. I don't think this video would have been half as interesting without his input, so I'm very thankful for that. 
Beyond that, I, I don't have too much more to say on this. I still own the figure. Um, I haven't had anyone say that, hey, I want to buy that from you or whatever. <laughs> uh, not yet, at least. We'll see what happens in the future here. I might not own it forever. I don't, I don't want to have to hoard it away. I feel like there's many other Galador super fans, some that are even bigger fans than I am, that would love to get their hands on this one day. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with it. We'll see what happens. But um, for now, I think Evil Nick is in a happy home um, and has a proud owner. Now here's about the time that Slugger starts getting into live streaming, and this was something brand new for me as an experience. Um, so I had a test stream that uh, I did on June 30th, 2022, and that was followed up immediately by the July 1st, 2022 for Rock Raiders Day, uh, building every LEGO Rock Raiders set from memory. Both of these experiences were a lot of fun. I had, had a lot of fun with them. They, they are quite uh, tiring because <laughs> you're talking for so long, right? And I, I'm used to that as a teacher, right? You, know, you use your speaking voice quite a bit in, in this profession. Um, but uh, get, getting used to the culture of like trying to watch the chat and try to talk to folks at the same time. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. And um, it's something I'd like to do more of. Uh, the, the, the real problem is that when I do a live stream like this, that essentially takes the place of a video that I could have done. And here's where that, that money aspect ties into it as well too, because I don't monetize my live streams. So making live streams is just something I do for fun and they, they don't earn any money. And that, that decision making, even though I, I know I've, I've said this up and down, this is just a hobby, but once you introduce money into it, it does make your, it in, impacts your decision making. It, it, it makes things more complicated. So live streams, I know for a lot of content creators, live streams are the money maker, right? That's where you get your donations and all this sort of stuff. Um, for me, at least currently, they're not, right? So this is um, just something I do for, for, I guess, vanity's sake, <laughs> right? Just <laughs> hanging out, having fun, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Um, the, the, uh, the thing holding me back from doing more is that it, it would transform my channel. It would perhaps negatively transform the channel into being something where we just kind of hang out and uh, talk about things half the time. Whereas I kind of want to be a channel based on making videos with scripts, with production value, that sort of stuff. So I can't have both. That's what I'm trying to say here. It, it's, it's, it's one or the other, or at least, you know, 80% one thing, 20% the other thing, which is kind of where the balance is sitting. Probably maybe even more 90%, 10%, uh, which is fine by me. That, 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 that's good. But I do enjoy live streaming. It is a lot of fun. It's just that it interferes with the other things that I want to accomplish with this channel and with my limited time here on Earth, right? Slugger got an email address. <laughs> The thumbnail of this video is forever hilarious to me. Um, the video is just a small little disclaimer saying that, hey, you can send me stuff. Um, I think folks might have read into that a little bit too much <laughs> because all of a sudden I received a whole ton of emails and comments of folks saying like, hey, I sent you my, my mock that I created or I sent you my, my, my stuff, my photos. Um, I can't wait to see them featured in a video. And I was sitting here kind of puzzled, like, I, I don't remember ever saying I was going to feature them in a video. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I guess this is just something that a lot of other people do, um, is they get community submissions and then they feature them in videos. Um, yeah, I, that's not something I'm at all interested in. Sorry, uh, I was just curious. I just wanted to see what people were building because I, I'm just a genuinely curious person, I suppose. But uh, yeah, um, no, this was never supposed to be um, the start of something like a community, like fan submissions and all these sorts of things like that. I, no, no, it was just, I made an email address and I was just wanted to see what people were working on because I'm curious. So um, yeah, sorry if that wasn't communicated clearly enough. That's maybe on me, sorry. Rock Raiders Canon. This was a uh, video that was inspired by a lot of discussions I had on uh, various Rock Raiders discords and whatnot, talking about the lore of the series, what counts, what doesn't count, that sort of thing. 
By and large, I think this is a really great video and is a strong follow-up to the series, um, or a further entry in the series of the Rock Raiders retrospective, I mean. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me to do something like this for time cruisers and adventurers and that sort of stuff. I don't know if I will. Um, I, I think a lot of the points that I bring up in this video stand for those series as well. The idea of there just being many conflicting sources of lore, so you have to decide on which ones you value more than others. Um, I kind of, in a roundabout way, already did that with Time Cruisers. It's kind of baked into the, the video series itself because I paid a lot of credence to the audio dramas, those radio plays. I value that, um, that lore more than, say, the comic, um, which is, to me, just a little bit more of like, oh, they're just making it up as they go along, so it's, it's less engaging to me than the, the well-told story uh, that is in the audio plays. So I was already kind of making those decisions and baking it into the videos. Uh, so that, that, that's what I'm thinking of there. Uh, same thing with adventurers too, right? Um, there, there's certain pieces of lore that are going to be more important than others. Usually the stuff that you see in Lego magazines themselves is pretty low on the list because that's the stuff that ends up being changed due to localization and other factors as well. I know some folks out there really play into the idea that all things Lego are interconnected within a certain universe. Um, that's that's not really my thing. Um, so I don't know. The, the, the idea of conflicting canon um, doesn't affect my enjoyment of a theme. Um, sometimes it can be frustrating though to, to try to pin down what is this character named? <laughs> so that that can be frustrating uh, sometimes. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I'm a Star Trek fan, right? And the the whole extended, you know, how many seasons of television there are, how many movies, and you have to pick and choose your battles when it comes to enjoyment of of a, of a series like Star Trek. Some of it is not any good, <laughs> and some of it is great. And uh, sometimes you, you just have to make up your own head canon of like this one is canon this one isn't canon um yeah enjoy what you enjoy uh, i think i think that's that's the the overall message here is there is no arbiter of this is canon this is not canon when it comes to lego especially lego the uh lego themes from the 90s like this it was around this time that I got to uh, co-host or be a guest uh, guest star on the Permanent Detour podcast. Um, these folks uh, reached out to me um, a few, few uh, months prior, I think, uh, to that uh, to that recording uh, because they were fans of the channel. And, and at first, I had no idea why they talked to me because they they were doing podcasts about like the latest Marvel movies and all this other sort of stuff. And I, I just kind of felt like, well, there's nothing. Than I can offer to that. Um, although I was pretty optimistic. Like I've, I, it sounds weird, but I've always wanted to be on a podcast. That was just some, something that, uh, like, I, once those things started becoming a thing, I was like, oh, I want to do that one day. Uh, it's just not something I've ever sat down and tried to do myself. So being able to uh, leech off of their abilities as podcast hosts was was fun for me. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we did that recording together. We did another one about a year later. Um, um, or eight months later, I should say, and uh, I look forward to the next time we sit down and do it again. Rock Raiders Combiner Models. The Kabaya sets really turned me on to this idea of combining other sets together, and they have actually, or there's actually been a few um, Time Cruisers Combiner Models um, up to this point as well, so I thought, hey, why not, why not the Rock Raider uh, retail sets? This was an idea for uh, live streams, um, and I, I think I did it once or twice since since then. Um, and it, it 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 still stands as an idea, and I still get people giving me suggestions of which ones to combine, that sort of thing. It's just that I don't do a lot of live streams, and so sometimes I have something uh, that I do want to build for a live stream. This was just kind of meant as a uh, a good placeholder sort of thing, where if I didn't have a specific set I wanted to build for a live stream or a specific topic or whatever, I could always fall back on this. And it's just kind of been, I guess, you know, the 
proof's in the pudding. I haven't really had uh, many opportunities to fall back on this. Um, so that's unfortunate because I, I do enjoy the process of, of combining sets together like that. And I think this gives us a, a good vehicle to use. So I don't know, maybe this summer, maybe we'll dive into this idea a little bit more. The Hypno Cruiser, the worst Lego set of all time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't mind putting those uh, those pundits on blast for that. Um, I, I feel like that is poor journalism or poor writing, whatever you want to call it at the end of the day here. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, again, this is this is um, these are um, negative opinions held by people that don't know what they're talking about. Uh, very obviously have never handled these sets before. They're just judging them based on a single box art photo and saying like, ah, that set looks crazy. Therefore, it's terrible. And uh, I see so much of that surrounding time cruisers, surrounding Galador. Uh, I just, I just, I have no tolerance for it. I, I just, I just want to push back against it um, because it's, it's misinformed. Um, if, if you are going to have negative opinions of a set, you at least need some experience with that set first. I don't see that as a radical stance from my perspective, right? <laughs> that just seems, I don't know, normal <laughs> to me. <laughs> responsible, that's the word. It seems responsible to me. You don't want to just go around uh, spouting, spouting things that you have no idea about. It plays into that uh, that understanding that we all have opinions, but sometimes our opinions matter and sometimes our opinions don't matter. And I think understanding when our opinions of things don't matter is part of becoming a mature adult. Anyways, the video itself, I feel like this is a fantastic video for a fantastic set. I'm really happy with the way that the video turned out here, and uh, the Hypno Cruiser still stands as one of my all-time favorites. Um, not, not, not just the video here, but uh, the, the set itself. Uh, it's stellar. It's so good. It's such a great set to jump into Time Cruisers with, and uh, it has so many bells and whistles, so much attention to detail in it as well. Um, it's fantastic. The, the, the best recommendation I had was that uh, it just needs a couple of newer molds so that the uh, legs don't get stuck in the seated position. And that, that's about it. That's, that's really the only major substantial change I can offer about it. The combiner model with the Explorians theme uh, in this video, uh, the, the, these these two uh, ships, they, they were pretty dreadful. <laughs> I, I won't mince words. Uh, they were pretty awful to build. Um, and both the Explorians set and the Hypno Cruiser set are far better apart than they are together. So uh, they don't get a recommendation from me. That, that's that's a, a single slug, <laughs> a single slug on the slugometer there for sure. The other thing that was fun to show off in this video was the Time Cruisers storage tub. And um, I was able to get my hands on two of these and the story might be uh, <laughs> might be a little, uh, little interesting there. So uh, the first one I acquired by buying it from a seller in uh, Canada and it was the only one available in Canada and I, I paid them to ship it out to me with some uh, Time Cruiser sets inside of it and whatnot. Um, so I got that, I was pretty happy with it, it was, it was awesome. And I started using it as my go-to uh, container for carrying Lego around with me uh, if, if I need to go out in public with Lego, <laughs> which happens sometimes if I'm going to my local used Lego store um, and needing to pick up some new bricks or something, or I've got a model that's on, on the go and I want to take it with me so I know what pieces exactly I need to pick up, that sort of stuff. And one day I took it with me and um, one of the uh, folks, one of the patrons at the store uh, looked over and said, hey, I I've got one of those too. I've been looking to get rid of it. Uh, can I can I sell it to you? And I'm like, heck yeah, you can. <laughs> and so they dropped it off at my, at my door um, about a week later. And uh, now I have two. And they're great bins. Um, they're lots of fun. I love the purple hue of them and they still get used uh, to this day. So they're in a happy home for sure. Slugger talks about music, talking about Cubase and recording music. This is a video that um, I think is really fantastic, but 
isn't made for everybody. In fact, it's made for very few people. This is not one I recommend going out and just go go check it out because I think it's great. Um, no, th this is this is one where if that description sounded interesting to you, or if the video title looks interesting, you've probably already watched it at this point. Uh, this is not one that's gonna do crazy numbers. <laughs> nothing like that, nothing like that. So this is my first video that had nothing to do with Lego. This is just about the creative process behind making music, which is something I, I do every day. And it's uh, something that I have a lot of experience in um, talking about, right, as a music teacher, uh, as an educator in the field of music. So I took that opportunity to combine my two loves together here into one video, and uh, I, I really like this one. I go back and watch it sometimes too, because it, it's really cool to hear mixes isolated like that. So if you're, if you're curious, like one of the things I go through and do in the video is I take out certain instruments from the mixes, or I, I listen to them in isolation on their own. So you hear new details uh, from the songs that you don't otherwise hear. And I think that's cool. I think it's a lot of cool, uh, cool insight that you gain into the creative process by listening to that sort of stuff. So the video is there if you're interested in it. And of course, I followed it up with posting all of the Rock Raiders songs on YouTube as well, too. So folks can listen to them on YouTube. Uh, not monetized, so <laughs> hopefully you're not getting any ads on them. I don't know if that if that's how that works, but um, yeah, they're there if you want them. They're also on my Bandcamp, of course, and it's all available to fr uh, to download for free there. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Eventually. <laughs> uh, the production of this video uh, rivals, there's there's no rival to it. It, it. it took so much time to do this video. So many reiterations, so much starting from the beginning and working forward again. This was, um, this was a video that had to be right. It just had to be. So it took a lot of time. And now we were looking at the How to Build Rock Creator series as uh, created by a committee, more or less, right? It wasn't just me anymore. It was multiple voices weighing in on the project, on these different builds. So in order to get this right, there was a ton of behind the scenes discussion on the topic of how to reverse engineer these sets, what our priorities should be, how should we present the information, all that sort of stuff. And it's part of the reason why this series is still ongoing to this day. Almost a year later, I still haven't finished it. Uh, it's because it just takes so long. It takes so much time behind the scenes to get this right. Um, so, and at the end of the day, it's worth it. It's worth it to get it right. Get, get it right the first time so you don't have to do a complete revision video like this one here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, th this is a great video. Um, the, it, it took so much effort, but I think I think it really spells it out in a in a meaningful way. Um, it goes through take, takes you through the whole thought process behind it. It's a it's a mandatory video when it comes to enjoying the rest of the series, or the rest of the How to Build Rock Raider series. You have to see this one, I think, to to put it into the proper frame of understanding for the rest of it. So uh, I'm I'm happy that a lot of folks have checked it out. I, th I think this is this is a, a really important one. Um, and I think it's just interesting uh, as well too. This definitely falls into that umbrella of um, videos that are made by folks um, that are really, really engaged or passionate about a topic. And sometimes it's just interesting to listen to. I, at least I find it. Uh, some topics that I have no interest in can be made interesting by someone very passionate about it. Um, and hopefully that's what this video uh, attempts to capture. The Galaxy Explorer is um, is one of the best sets of modern LEGO history, I think. Uh, at least from the ones I've experienced. It's fantastic. And it was, it was such a great value price-wise as well, too. Um, I, I totally understand the folks that went out and bought multiple copies to build many different spaceships. Um, yeah, I was blown away by this one. This, this was a set that I didn't... Uh, want when I first saw it. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed by it. I was like, oh, eh, it's just another classic space thing. Lego's done a ton of those, right? Uh, who cares? Um, but uh, when, once I learned that it had the alternate builds and instructions for those alternate models, uh, I was sold. Because that basically told me, oh, this is a creator three-in-one set in disguise. And it's also this really advanced uh, spaceship, like really detailed spaceship. 
Um, so it was kind of scratching a couple of good itches there for me. And I, 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 the only thing I regret is maybe not buying two, especially by getting a second one when they were on sale for, for really cheap. Um, but yeah, it, it's fantastic. An utterly fantastic set. Uh, phenomenal work. Phenomenal work. I think the video I made surrounding the set is, is all right. I think, I think it's pretty good. Um, but, um... Yeah, I don't have too much more to say about it other than that. Like, like it's serviceable. It does the job here. Uh, I don't think I broke any new ground with this entry, um, but I feel the set itself outweighs the, uh, the the creative potential of the video behind it. Finding a use for this strange Lego piece. <laughs> I think nowadays, if you go back and look at this video, the view count is quite high, and um, I, I just know from from historically speaking, uh, it never was that way when this video came out. This was, again, another one of those very niche videos, a niche topic um, that kind of took off later on. Now, I get it that the thumbnail here is a little bit more eye-catching, uh, because ever since, uh, well, I want to say Slugger's birthday even, um, ever since then, uh, thumbnail design was something I took a lot more seriously. You know, if you're not spending an hour making a thumbnail, uh, at least, then you're, you're doing something wrong here on the on the platform of YouTube right so the uh, the video here wasn't meant for a general audience but the thumbnail kind of makes it look like it is uh, so that, that's kind of interesting this one didn't receive any sort of negative attention um, which is good which is good um, but I, I found it very interesting to research this sort of stuff and the seller I talked to about it uh, put me on the right path when it came to looking into what was going on with this event in 2002 where they got to go and get a bunch of non-production parts from the basically from the fac factory floor, right? So uh, that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And so it's got a cool history to it. And I think I found a great way to make it work, right? To put it into a, a, a build, a mock that made sense, uh, that paid tribute to how unique this piece is. The stop motion animation of Chief coming down on the platform is far and away the most advanced and intricate piece of work I've ever had to do on this channel. <laughs> Um, he really is suspended there, and I'll try to show some uh, behind the scene shots here. And little by little, like one plate at a time, I, I would bring him down, and then I animated him there as he's suspended. And uh, it was very high stakes, right? Because if, if he falls down or if, if you mess it up, everything's lost. So um, that that was a, that was a tough challenge. That was a tough challenge to get right. I think one thing, I, one trick I did do though, because with stop motion animation, you're afforded techniques that you can't do otherwise. One technique I did do uh, was that I didn't start with him up out of sight. I actually started the animation with him down in the center with the camera focused on him. Then I went through the animation uh, process of having him move his arms around, look like he's speaking, all that sort of stuff. Then I animated him moving back upwards towards the ceiling out of frame. And then when it came to putting the whole clip together, I took that out of frame animation of him moving up, reversed it to have him come down, and then added that in right before he started talking. And that linked the two worlds together. The, the, the tough part there was that I had to make sure I got the start of his speech and the end of his speech to look very similar because that was the jumping off point for that, that animation on both ends. So he had to start and stop in basically the same position, the same posture to make it fluid. And I think it worked, it turned out really well. I'm, I'm really happy I went through the effort to get that done right the first time so that it didn't become a subpar animation. It's it's something that I'm, I'm proud of here. It's, it's a really good animation clip. And I have I think I have it uh, available in that video description if you want to use it for your own projects. Uh, if, if not, I will add it there so, th so that it's there. How to build the power station. This was another monstrous project that we took on, um, trying to go through and use as many sources as we could to best represent the power station from LEGO Rock Raiders. Um, this one used uh, a bit of the retail sets and had some modifications from some community members as well included in it. 
And um, beyond that, though, it, we, we spent a long time looking at reflections, chasing ghosts, staring at pixels, that sort of thing. Uh, so again, the, the, the back end to this, the, 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 the under, under the water part of the iceberg was very vast. And so what you get here is a 13 minute video, quite a long one uh, for my, my channel at least, of, of really you know high quality to the point uh, information. But what went on behind the scenes was hours and hours of pixel hunting. So that, uh, you know, <laughs> there's, there's always two sides to everything here. Um, but uh, the results are great. I think I think this is a really solid, uh, really solid episode of the series. And uh, to my knowledge, no major mistakes. So hooray, we did it. <laughs> the Adventures of Clutch Powers, the movie. Um, yeah, <laughs> I had to watch this because I uh, made a bet with the folks on the Permanent Detour podcast that I would watch the movie if they bought a Galador set and they held up their end of the bargain so I had to hold up my end of the bargain and um, yeah it was uh, it was awful it, it, it was it was wretched it started good um, but that movie devolved and I, I uh, yeah I hope I never have to watch it again um, I, I really did not enjoy it uh, and then the video on top of that, the whole rigmarole of trying to get it onto YouTube, trying this, that, and the other thing, it's fair use, you know, critique of the movie, review, all that sort of stuff, eh, the copyright bot just kept hitting it and hitting it, so I decided, you know what, I'd give up, I'll just put it on a Google Drive and you can grab the link to it, download it if you like, I don't care, um, yeah, because it, it's not, it's not a, um, it's not a way to watch the movie, right? <laughs> like, it's not like I'm offering up the movie for free. I'm, I'm just trying to offer up my review of the movie for free. But uh, yeah, no, no, no dice, no dice. So that's too bad. Um, yeah, I, I think the video I made is, is good. Like, I think it's funny. I, I've, I've watched, I've watched my, um, my review of it a few times since creating it. Um, and I, I don't know, it, it's fun kind of looking back because I, I remember uh, making that video. Um, it was the first video I made in what is now my current home. Uh, so I remember <laughs> wheeling in my, uh, my office chair in, into the room, ha setting up my microphone and putting the laptop down on the floor, I think. And uh, it was just basically me in an empty room watching <laughs> Clutch Powers, the movie, for two hours <laughs> alone. <laughs> and that's how I decided to spend my day. <laughs> The Zalax Racers, every single Zalax Racer from uh, Lego Racers 2, uh, or I guess rather from the Lego Racers theme. Um, yeah, this is an interesting video. I I, um, I think this one holds up well too. I know I've been saying that a lot, um, but hopefully that speaks to the quality of, of the work that I've, I've put into this. Uh, my whole goal with, with creating YouTube videos is that I, I want them to be in a way timeless. I don't wanna make content that's gonna be dated. Um, but, you know, in a month's time, it, it's no longer relevant or valid. Um, so that's just not my goal as, as a YouTube creator. Anyways, Zalex Racers, this video here, um, introduces us to the Slugometer. For the very first time, we get the Slugometer. And this was something that Brett and I were working on, trying to come up with a way to rank things uh, against each other, to score them in a way, right? Uh, to have a unique system to do that. Now, one thing I don't think I do a good job of in this video is explaining how the slugometer works. I, in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way, I, I say, oh, it's an objective system of measurement, right? You know, obviously it isn't, right? It's, it's, it's subjective. But um, one thing I don't stress enough is that it's relative to the series that it's being used in. That means that the sets are being scored against each other and not against some sort of metric of goodness, right? A three slug thing in a series does not necessarily mean it is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It could, but it doesn't a lot of the times. And a one slug series, or a one slug rating rather, does not mean that a set is 
undesirable or bad. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. So I use a series like Rock Raiders as an example, and I'll get to that uh, I'll get to that um, breakdown later on. But I gave a couple of the sets a single slug rating because I have to. That's how the, the that's how the slugometer works. It's only got three points on it, right? So if I just said that every set that was good that I liked was an instant three slug rating, that's a pretty worthless system of measurement right there, right? Because most of the sets that I build, I like. <laughs> most of the sets that I own, I like. They would all get three slug ratings. And, uh, you know, that that's no good. So what, what I try to do with the slugometer is I try to rank the sets against each other. That means there's always going to be sets or, or a set that uh, ranks high, and there's always going to be a set or sets that rank low. So when it comes to the Zalax racers, because functionally they're all the same, the only way to measure them was with the aesthetic choices when it came to the color palette. And so that's what I thought was a, a good way to um, introduce the slugometer, a nice worthy way to do it, where it's it's low stakes. It's basically like saying, I like these colors, I don't like these colors. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably notice that there's no like green colored racers that uh, made it into the into the top three, right? It, it, you know, green's just a color that I, as a person, don't really enjoy. So th those, those sets are, you know, lower down on the spectrum compared to your your reds and your your blacks and your blues. That's those, those the purples, right? Yeah, those those ones rank a lot higher to me, just because of my subjective pre preference. One other thing that maybe I do regret a little bit about the video is that um, I I feel that I, in giving certain racers a one slug rating, I might have negatively or made people feel bad about themselves for liking those sets and that's not my intention at all either um, I, I definitely saw some comments of people that were disappointed that I ranked some of some of the racers quite lowly especially ones that they quite liked um, so I just tried to reinforce this idea that, that hey it's just it's just my opinion it's just you know one slug's opinion and at the end of the day it should have no bearing on your life <laughs> right <laughs> this is just for entertainment this is entertainment purposes here and uh, sometimes you know I, I will I will use the slugometer in a way to um, recommend purchase decisions like if you want to get into a series so you want to get into Rock Raiders right so you want to get into Dino Island whatever the situation is there um, the slugometer can be used for that as well but that um, that shouldn't necessarily be the be-all end-all of of um, goodness when it comes to ranking things with a metric system like that overall though i think this this is a really great video um i, I know most of it is just me talking about colors but there's a lot of factoids that i throw in throughout um such as the stuff about galador in in with uh, rip and whatnot so uh that that that's all that's all good stuff there's a lot, lots of little nuggets to discover in this video i think for sure the whirling time warper this is a this is a really interesting set and um, I, I think the video does a good job of showing it off. I go through all the different ins and outs of the set. Um, it, it's nothing remarkable at the end of the day. It, it's, it's what has become standard fare, which is a good thing though, I think in, in a lot of ways, because it shows that there is hopefully a um, expected level of quality um, behind these videos, uh, which, which is good. The Belleville bathtub always gives me kicks there, this idea of it. It sounds like a mathematical like constant that you have to learn about, a ma mathematical theorem. I, I'm not sure what I'm saying. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand it all. But the Belleville bathtub, that, that's, a, that's a cool phrase. <laughs> In this one, I created my own combiner model using RoboForce and the Whirling Time Warper, and it came out really well, I thought, the uh, the Chrono Wing. Um, so yeah, I, I was really into that, um, and, I, and I think um, the results speak for themselves. I, th I think it's a strong combiner model. Um, not something that I do typically, but it was a fun experiment. Yeah. So you want to get into Rock Raiders. Uh, this is the first time we get to use the Slugometer a little bit more uh, properly, I would say, in terms of what it's designed to do. Ranking sets within a series, and in this case, recommending which sets to prioritize when collecting. 
I think the bulk of this video is actually kind of a preamble explaining what the video is, which is maybe not something that I wanted to do, but one thing that uh, making videos on YouTube has taught me is that it's better to over explain something than under explain something. It saves you a lot of headache later on when folks are asking questions about it in the comment section or just generally confused about what you mean when you're talking about certain things. So I definitely err on the side of over explanation these days, or at least I try to. It's something I actively try to do. With regards to Rock Raiders, obviously I think it's a fantastic series. If I could just give all the all the sets three slugs, I probably would, because they're all great in their own ways. But because of the way that I've set up the slugometer to work, there has to be a one slug set, there has to be a two slug set, there has to be a three slug set. It's just the way that it operates. And three slugs in Rock Raiders does not mean it's the same as three slugs on Dino Island or three slugs in Ice Planet, whatever, right? It's all relative to its own series. I hope folks have found this video helpful or at least entertaining at the end of the day. Uh, my goal is to give advice um, when it comes to which series to collect, uh, which sets in that series to, to collect rather, and not have to wait the the years it's going to take me to go through every single set for some of these uh, so, some of these themes. So this is a shorthand way to get some of that information across. Um, there, there's also going to be times where I just might not have a lot to say about certain sets in a series, um, like like something like Explorians or Spireus. I, I don't think I have much to say about those sets, but nonetheless, I own them and I've built them and so it kind of makes sense for me to talk about them. Uh, I feel like there is a, a bit of an ownness, a bit of a duty for, for me to do that. Um, so that, that's what this uh, video format is trying to target. Lego Star Wars, the other dark meat. <laughs> um, this one might be might be considered by some to be a, a total dud. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and looking back, it, it's definitely one where I feel like I missed the mark for a lot of folks. Um, one thing that obviously I got wrong right out of the gate is this idea of the phrase, the other dark meat. That's that's not um, that's not what it's <laughs> what the phrase is. It's supposed to be the other white meat, and so uh, this this is not a um, an A to B sort of metaphor. It's like an A to C or an A to D sort of metaphor. It takes a lot of leaps, uh, and so it left a lot of people confused. And um, I don't blame them. I don't blame them in this case here. So I definitely underexplained what I was trying to get at with that. Um, and maybe the video ends before it really gets going, right? Um, the, the, the whole purpose here behind this, this outing was to try to uh, make the connection between LEGO Rock Raiders and LEGO Star Wars and to try to solidify that as being a factor in the pieces we see used in both, uh, both series. So to that extent, I, th I feel like it does a pretty good job at that. Um, there's obviously more that I could have said about it, more that I could have said about LEGO Star Wars in general. Um, but you know, that, that, that can all be saved, be saved for a future, uh, future video, I'm sure. Um, there are some pretty cool observations in this video though, such as the Photoshopping that is done to the um, Rock Raiders uh, box art and uh, manuals and, and whatnot. I find that pretty fascinating to see. So yeah, it's definitely a hodgepodge video. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. I know that doesn't necessarily scratch everyone's itch. Um, so I apologize if that's maybe not one that uh, really resonated with you, but um, I, I feel like for the most part, it, uh, it, it succeeded in the, the avenues that I wanted it to. How to build the docks from Lego Rock Raiders. Another one that I felt um, took took a bit of time, <laughs> took a while to get here, um, but it, it was worth it was worth the journey in the end. Um, building the super docks model in this in this uh, video here was probably the highlight of it for me. I really enjoy that model, and I still have uh, most of it constructed uh, to this day. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of back and forth with this one, and. Like maybe, maybe if I had to point out a mistake I made, I would say using the eight by 16 brick 
in the instructions for this model was probably a mistake. I probably should have used two eight by eight bricks to be more correct, right? Uh, like, I don't know, at the end of the day, that it, it, it's small potatoes. Like I, I say in the video that it's it, it should be eight by eight bricks, whatever, right? You know, it, it's it's not, uh, like, like, like I've said before, I'm not a perfectionist when it comes down to it. Uh, th this to me is good enough. Um, whether you agree or disagree, I guess that's that's up to you. Um, but I feel like all the information here is uh, more or less correct, or as correct as we can get it uh, with our resources. Overall, I think the Docks is a pretty cool model, but at the end of the day, I think there are better Rock Raiders models. Um, so, yeah. The Curse of LEGO Rock Raiders. Um, this was my Halloween video from, I guess, last year now, 2022. And it serves as a follow-up to the giant zoo video in a lot of ways. However, it's got its own little spin to it here. So the part in question here, that anchor piece that is uh, attached to all the roll cages, I just noticed that it had like a little seam line in it. So I started fidgeting around with one one day, uh, you know, taking a knife to it <laughs> just to see what's going on here. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, I discovered a lot of things for myself uh, <laughs> that were quite strange. And so I tried to pack them into this video here, and uh, I, I heard back from a lot of folks, a lot of like really diehard LEGO people that never knew about this. Uh, I'm not saying I'm the first person to discover it, obviously. That I'm sure someone has already ripped apart these pieces before and looked at it. Um, but it was interesting, at least for me, this was the first time I, I had come across this sort of thing. Um, and I uh, decided to make some kind of weird and random mocks with it as well as a part of the video. There's a ton of stuff packed into the small two minute runtime. I think it deserves rewatching, right? To, to try to take it all in. The, the finale of the video too, that the, the horror and kind of humor that is communicated only through photography and music, uh, I think it's really cool. I, I, th I think I, I, th I really nailed it there. So I'm, I'm proud of that, of that section, especially of the video. The original Time Cruiser, Max Time Buster. The impetus for creating this video came about rather suddenly, and uh, it was due to Chris Faber's Instagram account, uh, where he posted pictures of this thing. I uh, I couldn't believe it, and um, it, it it's it's just a remarkable model. Um, he has since seen my video and has talked to me about it. Um, he hasn't really shared any more details because he doesn't really have any more details about it. He thinks it might be somewhere in Denmark right now if it's still put together, but who knows at this point. Um, yeah, he, he's open to collaborating in the future too, so we'll see where that where that leads. Um, but yeah, th this, this was a fun fun little outing here and it was a um, an opportunity that you don't often get um, <laughs> to talk about time cruisers news in 2022. That's a, <laughs> that's a little out there. Um, the, the bit at the beginning there with Lego Island, that was a lot of fun too. I got to do some singing on the channel for the first time. Uh, I, I'm a trained singer, you know, that's what, that's what I do. And um, yeah, that, that, was, that was fun. If anyone's curious about getting that sort of compression on your voice for the Lego Island sound, all you need to do is to reduce the, the bit rate of the sound file uh, to a quarter of its original uh, running like so most most sound files I think, I think their the bit rate is like 44.1 so as long as you're around 11 points um, then you're 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 golden <laughs> The Flying Time Vessel served as the follow-up episode and uh, moves us further along in the series of the Time Cruisers retrospective. This is a good, uh, this is a good one too. I think uh, maybe not as landmark as say like the Hypno Cruiser video, but I think this was this one was fun nonetheless. Um, I got to use some Star Trek clips and doctor them up a little bit too. <laughs> that, that, that's always fun. Uh, yeah, it makes makes me laugh at least. Um, yeah, I went through, talked about all the different mechanisms here. Um, I even tried to tackle that weird uh, alternate build from the uh, from the comic strip. I just tried to recreate that in Lego. That that was difficult. And honestly, the photos don't do it justice. It was huge. That thing was really tall, um, so it was tough to photograph properly. I also talk a little bit about the radio play, the German radio play, a little bit more in this video, give a bit more detail on that. I had actually done a ton of digging into that, trying to find the name of the composer who wrote the, the theme song. I just couldn't find it anywhere, and I still haven't to this day. So, um, yeah, if, if you have answers, <laughs> just, just let me know. I'm still looking for them. <laughs> 
Overall, I think this was a cool, fun set and made for a good video as well, too. How to build the support station. Uh, th this is probably the most requested structure from any of the ones in uh, LEGO uh, Rock Raiders. So it was nice to finally get the chance to dive into this one in more detail. Despite it being fairly straightforward, the, most of the aspects of this model were already pretty well defined by the time we got around to tackling it here. Uh, just because it's so open, you can really see the inside of the structure, you get a sense of the inner workings quite well just by looking at the renders. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this, this video was just kind of a paint by numbers sort of experience here. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel or anything. I took the opportunity to talk about its original functions in the game, uh, as well as to dive into a little bit of the process of reverse engineering again uh, with this one here. The big question uh, on uh, on our mind was which way do we put the uh, the um, control panel on the inside? Which way does it face? Joystick on the right, joystick on the left. And so we went through a bunch of different renders trying to solve that. And eventually, like, we, we did reach the answer, obviously. We had to use other means to get there. Um, but then later on, I received a comment from someone else talking about how they had seen the a, a third render, a different render, in the tool store video. And I went back and I looked at it, and they were right. There it was. Um, so I don't know how we missed that, but we definitely missed a very obvious clue that would have helped us along a lot quicker. At the end of the day, it, it still confirmed what we already knew, so, you know, nothing, nothing wrong there, but um, I, I guess it made for a more interesting story to tell it this way, <laughs> despite it being more or less um, long-winded for no need. <laughs> Whoa! Extreme! The noble art of studless base plates. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I love this video. I, I, I think, I think um, it's, it's a real winner. And this is one that I'm actually happy a lot of people have seen, despite how horribly embarrassing the intro is for it. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is one of the most popular videos on my channel, um, and I, I think it's a great look into this set, which is one that isn't often talked about, obviously, and uh, it also talks about raised base plates as, as a general practice that LEGO used to have. So yeah, it kind of scratches a couple of uh, itches there. It's, it's a multi-niche <laughs> topic, which is good. And um, building the sets was a lot of fun. I went through and took my time with it, went in opposite order. I started with the alternate builds first and worked my way to the main model. And I really love this kit. The, the set itself, uh, it ranks really high for me, um, just in a, in a general sense. I, I can't give it a three slug rating because I already talked about how that, it, it, in order to do that, you have to compare it to the other sets in the series. I don't have all the sets from Extreme Team yet, so I can't give this one a three slug rating, but it gets a high recommendation from me. Uh, if you're able to seek it out and, and nab one for yourself, I don't think you'll be disappointed. It, it, it's a great little model. Now we're taking a look at the Twisted Time Train, the final set for the Time Twisters sub-theme within Time Cruisers. Um, th this set and the video, I think both sit fairly mid for me. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of either. Um, I, I think I did a serviceable job on the video here. There, there was a lot of stuff that uh, required a lot of new photography <laughs> on my end here, you know, doing the brass section and all these other other parts. Um, and I feel like some of it was pretty successful, but um, th this one doesn't stand out to me uh, the way that like a grand finale should. I suppose maybe it isn't a, a true finale because it's midway through the uh, Time Cruisers retrospective series. This is just a, a wave farewell to the um, Time Twisters themselves. So, yeah. Now this, this mock here, this uh, one I did, the cliffside mock, that took me so long. It took, took so much time and I just needed it for basically one photo. <laughs> I spent more time building that mock than I spent on the rest of the videos. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I disassembled it later because it was kind of taking up extra space that I wanted for other things. So, oh well. <laughs>
One thing I was really happy about was my additions to this set, adding in other cars into the train. I feel like this adds a lot of value to the set as a whole, um, being able to expand upon the size of the train, as well as the variety of, of what type of uh, cargo you can haul along. I thought, I thought a vault car was a really inspired choice, and I really liked that little uh, you know spider uh, chrono crawler <laughs> time machine uh, that I that I designed as well too using some insectoids parts so that was fun uh, in the end here I, I feel like this is an adequate send-off to the time twisters hopefully we'll see them pop up from time to time in future videos um, but uh, they had a good run they, they had a had a fun time uh, hanging out with slugger I think so yeah it was good good times the piece that could save life on Mars. This is a video that was in the right place at the right time. Um, completely beyond my control. Um, at this point in time, Slugger had received a fairly high profile shout out from Big Yellow, and it was directing a lot of eyes towards the channel. And it just so happened that the next video I had loaded in the chamber here was a fairly general, broad topic um, video, or at least at least from my perspective it was. This was one that anyone could jump in on and get the gist of what this channel is about. And so, yeah, it, it took off. And retroactively, a lot of the videos prior to this one took off as well. And the current success that the channel is seeing is largely due to this, as well as Big Yellow's generosity in that regard. So for the video itself, I, I really like this one. I, I, th I think it, uh, it turned out well. And I've had this one on the back burner for a long time. I, I, um, behind the scenes, I have a list of um, video titles and video ideas that I keep. And this one's been on the list probably since, I don't know, over a year. Uh, it, it's been on that list and finally I had the the opportunity and the means to go about doing it So I decided to sit down and actually put it put it into uh, into production And this is the results and I'm quite happy with it, too I want to talk more and more about life on Mars as as we continue but uh, for now This is a, this is a good uh, a good starting point. I think um, so there is going to be more Life on Mars content in the future here, hopefully a full-on retrospective series eventually, but I got to get some other projects done first before I can dive into that one. The City of Lanterns! <laughs> <laughs> so this is the City of Lanterns, and I very, very nearly did a recording, a little recording of the Kim Mitchell song, uh, Patio Lanterns, to, to these new lyrics. Um, but uh, yeah, alas. <laughs> Anyways, um, th this video was interesting. I actually recorded the script for this video all the way back when I did the Street Racer video. Um, uh, around that time period at least. So that's how old the script was for this. And it's very rare that I keep a script in the back catalog for that long. Usually by the time I'm voice acting or you know recording a script uh, through a microphone, that means the video is gonna be produced within the next two or three weeks. It's very rare that I sit on a, uh, a script like that, a recording like that for that long. So uh, I don't know why I necessarily sat on it for so long. It was just I, I wanted to get through more of the Time Cruiser stuff before I talked about this set. Originally, I had this one slated for after the um, Mystic Mountain Time Lab. But what ended up happening is so much time had gone by that I kind of felt worried that LEGO would retire this set before I had a chance to talk about it. And that would make me upset. So I uh, kind of pushed this one into production. Um, this is this is almost the, the same situation that um, doing the Galador video when I did it. Um, it it's very similar to what, what happened here. Um, I, I wanted to do the Galador video after the Rock Rares HQ, but time didn't allow, and uh, same with this one as well. As for the video itself, I, I quite like this one, and um, I go through and offer up a lot of changes to the set, and that definitely ruffled some feathers. A lot of folks didn't agree with the recommendations I had for this set, and um, I'll, I'll be honest, I feel like a lot of the comments either 
you know, missed the point of the video or didn't listen very closely to some of the stuff that I was saying in the video. Because a lot of a lot of the responses that I ended up having to type out were just verbatim things that I had said in the video. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I, I I get it. It's a long video. A lot of information comes pretty quickly here. But I, 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 at the end of the day, I just feel like some folks that watched it and commented on it missed some key details from it. So maybe that speaks to me and perhaps a lack of clarity or a lack of reinforcing some of the points I was making. Mm, but at the end of the day too, it, it's there, it's in the video. Um, so I don't know. This was a fun set. It was a really fun set to build. Hopefully I emphasized that adequately in the video. Um, but yeah, the building experience was just Really great, really great. Um, uh, one of my favorites that I've built to date, I think. And partially that was because of the amount of stickers. I really enjoy putting stickers on. Um, that to me is like icing on the cake. Love it, love it. So if stickers aren't your thing, you better stay away from this one. <laughs> oh, Crystal Tree. <laughs> this was a little video I did for Christmas uh, 2022. Uh, it reuses some of the photos I had taken the previous Christmas, actually, so I don't think there was any new photography here. But I did sit down and record some new music. I, I went and uh, played through a Christmas tree on my piano and uh, made up my own rendition of it with a few interesting chord choices. I wanted to make it a little bit different and uh, just set it to music and put it all together. And it was just meant to be a little one-off celebration. I don't know if I'll do one every year, but this, this one felt right at the time. And boom, straight from Christmas into Blacktron Boogaloo. The fear of missing out strikes back. Part two, whatever you want to call it here. Um, yeah. I, I was pretty disappointed uh, by the LEGO Group's actions here, and I, uh, I had to, I felt it necessary to make a video talking about it here. Um, this one was more premeditated than the first one. Obviously the first one was very reactionary. I went out, I bought the set, and then within the span of 16 hours I'd kind of made that whole video uh, based on my experiences. This one, on the other hand, was more set up ahead of time. I, I knew what I wanted to say, and um, I had written the script, recorded it, basically done all the video editing, and then by the time that the, uh, the, the set rolled out, by the time January 1st rolled around, I was basically just on, on the website kind of confirming what I already knew was going to be true about it. So, yeah, that's where this one came from. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I stand by the video. I, I, th I think it's, it's, uh, it's to the point. It, it doesn't mince words. And it's a, it's a un, uh, uncommon negative opinion <laughs> on Slugger's YouTube channel here. And I, I feel bad for the folks that only come in to see the negative stuff because sometimes that's what happens, right? You, you, you come in and then you see a video and you're like, oh, what? Why is this person complaining about this? I actually saw a few comments like that of people that are, had come in because my channel was recommended to them and then they were met with a video like this. So to to think that negativity is, is a... Um, is a goal of mine, right, <laughs> in order to draw views or whatever, is, is no, that's, that's not the case. And obviously the body of work that we've looked at so far um, proves that. I still haven't acquired the Blacktron set. Um, locally it's really expensive now. Um, I, I don't think I will ever, unless I can get it for very cheap. Um, it looks cool. It, it looks like it'd be a fun building experience. I wish I could have gone out and bought it. But there's therein lies the problem, right? <laughs> I would have bought this set, but I, I wasn't willing to spend the ludicrous amounts of money for getting over the paywall or spending a marked up price on the aftermarket. Neither one of those options are good options in my opinion. One mistake I got wrong in this video here was um, the name, the Blacktron Invader versus the Blacktron Cruiser. Um, apparently, I didn't, I didn't realize this, but the Blacktron Cruiser was the original name for the original model uh, overseas in, in like the UK and European markets. So I learned something new and I've been humbled. Again, just like the first FOMO video, I really haven't received any strong defense of this practice from folks uh, 
uh, online or from the Lego group itself or whatever, right? Uh, beyond the very generic, they're a business, so of course they're profit motivated, right? Um, yeah, they're, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's so much more nuance to it than that, though, right? There, there are positive business practices and there are predatory business practices <laughs> like we've got we've got gambling laws for a reason you know and i'm not saying this is this is an example of gambling or anything like that but there are business practices that are more harmful than others and to think otherwise is being knowingly obtuse i think Anyways, anyways, I, I don't make Lego videos to talk about monetary practices or to talk about the business behind it. Um, I, the only time I ever feel compelled to do that is when it negatively impacts the hobby. And uh, I've said it before and I, I'll say it again. The business practices of the LEGO group itself has the potential, or they have the potential rather, to ruin the entire hobby for me. Um, so I, I cross my fingers and I really hope it never comes to that day. But, it, but if they start going down the same road as your Wizards of the Coasts or your Bethesdas or whatever, uh, I just can't sit by and idly support that. So there you go. The Great Lego Plague of 2002. <laughs> This one was a lot of fun to create, and I think it hits all the marks. I think it hits all the marks here. <laughs> now, obviously, it's impossible to talk about this video without also talking about Solar Sands and the shout out that they gave me, <laughs> and, and, and largely in response to this in this video here. Um, so that had a huge impact on foot traffic to my channel and um, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. I love the video they made <laughs> about it as well too. It's hilarious. So uh, I recommend going and checking that out if, if you somehow haven't seen that yet. But um, yeah, this is something that I've felt for a long time about the sets that came out in this era of Lego and I haven't really been able to put into words until I did, I guess, until, I, until now. So the the main thing about this, about this video, the main critique that I was trying to convey is that there was a perfect storm of a new mold, a new piece that was large, obstructive, um, it conquered the overall aesthetic of a set, and it was also in 42% of the retail sets released that year, at least system sets, I mean. Now, it's a combination of those two factors. I, I thought I made that clear in the video, but I had a lot of folks that misunderstood me, so I, I probably didn't emphasize that enough. But it's both of those factors that make this a plague. Because I had a lot of folks just kind of point out, well, what about like regular slope bricks or plates? Like they're in so many different types of sets. And yes, they are, they are but they hide themselves away in those sets. They're not obtrusive, or obtr uh, yeah, obtrusive. They're not obtrusive. They don't take over the entire character of a set uh, the way that this piece does or these parts do. Um, likewise, I had folks point to like UFO as an example. Like those, those big half cylinders from UFO are way worse or like Rock Raiders is full of plague pieces. And I would agree if those big parts, let's, let's say the roll cage from Rock Raiders, if that roll cage from Rock Raiders was in 42% of the sets in 1999, it wasn't, it wasn't. It was hardly, it wasn't even in 42% of the sets within Lego Rock Raiders. So uh, yeah, the, the whole point behind me calling this a plague is it's a combination of both of those factors, a obtrusive piece that is tough to hide in, in a model and it's wide, spread adoption all in a blink of an eye because in 2001 there was zero sets that had these plague parts in them and in 2002 42 percent nearly half of the sets offered that year had these new parts and it completely transformed the look of the company in just a single year um, that's why it's a plague and I, I wanted to re-emphasize that here because I feel like some folks thought I was just being picky or maybe didn't uh, didn't have my numbers straight or something like that. I, I assure you, I, I, I do. 
<laughs> I, I did the homework there and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it, it does come down to aesthetics as well. But I think there are more objective measurements that you can look at uh, as to why to call this a plague, <laughs> which is what I tried to do in the video, right? That's why I went through the, the effort and the process of going through and analyzing the numbers, because I wanted to have something concrete to point to, to say, this is why it's a plague. Other than that, I don't think there's much of anything I'd change about this video. I think it's really successful. I think it's funny when it needs to be, and it's uh, informative as well too. Edutainment, which is what I strive for on my channel here. Uh, to be educational and entertaining at the same time. The Mystic Mountain Time Lab, the grand finale to the Time Cruisers retrospective series. This video is a big one. It's an even bigger project than the Rock Raiders HQ was, which is really saying something. I feel like so much of this video was so well executed, and yet it's almost entirely, entirely hampered by two very, um, very small mistakes. Uh, actually, I, you know what? Only, only one small mistake in it, and it's a big mistake to be honest. But uh, yeah, it, it, a little thing. Basically, the, the, these um, these yellow ornamentations that go on this helmet, they're not set exclusive, and so many people let me know about that. Um, Bricklink doesn't categorize that very well, in my defense, I'm gonna say, um, because in this set, the helmet isn't worn by a character, it isn't worn by a minifigure, so it's in the parts inventory of the set. And when you go into the parts inventory of the set and you compare it to parts inventory uh, from other sets, it, it looks like, it appears that this ornamentation um, sprue was only available in this set, so therefore set exclusive. What it fails to account for though is when these parts are used on minifigures in other sets. Now, obviously I should have known. I really should have known this was from the uh, the Dragon Masters theme, um, or Dragon Knights, or whatever it's called, from way back when in 1993, uh, because I had just done a video about that uh, a while back with the Trans Neon Orange video, because that's, that's what I talk about in that, in that, uh, in that video there. Um, so I should have I should have known, or I should have had that that feeling, um, but uh, say la vie, you know, I got it wrong, and uh, that that's on me. The other thing that folks were really quick to talk about was the um, the visor piece. This visor piece that I talk about um, making its final appearance in um, Trans Dark Blue. A lot of folks were very quick to point out its other usage in a Star Wars set. Uh, but it's the color black in that set. Uh, that, that, that doesn't count, right? So so uh, <laughs> I had to kind of explain to a lot of people that I guess misunderstood me there that the mold wasn't being retired, the part was being retired, and that is mold plus color. So when, when we talk about like a certain piece, it's implied that that is the mold plus the color being used together. You can't just make a Lego set, build it up with random uh, rainbow colors and say that it's a complete set. No, it's using the wrong pieces because those pieces aren't of the right color. It might be using the correct molds. That's cool. That's cool. But uh, it's a very different thing here. And that is something that um, probably came about because I had a lot of new eyes on the channel. Folks that weren't used to the way I talk about things. And so I think a lot of folks misunderstood me in that regard. Um, I, I, I really struggle to to come up with a way to <laughs> disseminate that sort of information effectively to everybody. It's probably impossible. Um, I don't know, like a channel trailer or something like that. Just a video I can say like, go watch this. This will, this will tell you all the information about how I talk about things, what these terms mean, that sort of thing. Um, so I haven't made one of those yet. If you have ideas for that, let me know, but uh, that's where I'm at at this point. Yeah, scrubbing through this video, th this one took so much work. There was so much photography done for it, and um, so many things that I had to build and um, to move around. Uh, yeah, this, this, this one took a ton of work. Um, I'm glad it turned out well, um, but yeah, it, it uh, had a lot going into it, that's for sure. 
At the end of the video, I go through and give a slugometer rating to all of the previous Time Cruisers sets. I feel like this is the the format. I think this is the right idea here um, because I don't necessarily want to go back and do a whole So You Want to Get Into Time Cruisers episode because I have this whole retrospective series that I can point to. I already did the long form content. Why do the short form content, right? Um, so this is probably what will end up happening going forward with future series as well too is when I hit that final episode I'll go back and do a slugometer rating of all the sets leading up into it and if you're looking for more more clarification as to why I'm giving them those ratings well you can go watch the videos that I did on, on the sets where I talk about is it a good set is it a bad set uh, sometimes we get as people and I get this way too sometimes we get very fixated on a score right we, we need to know what is the score it's not good enough to give a review of an album or a review of a video game you have to tell me how how many points does it get out of 10 how many points out of three how many slugs on the slugometer right <laughs> it's like that score means more than all of the words in the video and so that can be kind of, um, kind of, uh, I guess, frustrating to deal with sometimes. And um, e e both as a creator and as a consumer of content too. Sometimes the the score, I just need to know what the score is. When in reality, I should be looking deeper into the words that the the, the reviewer is communicating. Bionicle. While not as great as Galador, it's still a. Re <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, my history with Bionicle. This was a video that was a long time in the making, and um, I, I think it went over pretty well. I, I was I was pretty happy with it. Um, it didn't necessarily um, take off the way that I had maybe hoped it would back then, um, but it has since grown into a much more comfortable spot where I feel like a lot of folks have checked it out at least once here, which is good. Um, yeah, so Bionicle. I don't hate Bionicle. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't, um, but it's a lot more nuanced than that, isn't it, right? So I spent I spend about 10 minutes here going through and talking about why I have um, certain things about Bionicle that I love, why there are certain things about Bionicle that I love, and why there are certain things I don't have much affection for at all. <laughs> um, Bionicle stars being one of them, and, and that's something that folks brought up <laughs> in the comments section. Uh, they explained to me, Slugger, it's because the series was being cancelled anyway, and they were able to, to squeeze out one last hurrah for the Bionicle fans and stuff like that. And um, I know. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I guess I didn't explicitly say that in the video. I understand the circumstances behind Bionicle Stars. They are an explanation. They're not an excuse, though. <laughs> Bionicle Stars is still awful. It's embarrassingly bad. Um, and re recently I ca came into possession of one of the figures and uh, yeah, this is junk. This is garbage. Um, this is barely above the McDonald's toys that started it all way back when. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was embarrassed to see Bionicle uh, in that state back then, and I still am to this day, maybe even more so, right? So I feel like uh, Bionicle Stars doesn't get the hate it deserves <laughs> in a roundabout way. I mean, that that's maybe overly antagonistic of me to say, but um, yeah, I feel like it should be seen as a bigger embarrassment <laughs> than, than it is. Uh, I'm in the camp of they shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> Uh, it, it only tarnishes the Bionicle name further, so... Um, yeah, yeah. You're, you're allowed to disagree with that opinion, of course, uh, but it is an informed opinion. I, I know the circumstances behind Bionicle Stars, and um, having measured the build quality of them myself, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's garbage. It was really interesting to see um, everyone's responses to this video. Um, some folks were... Um, in agreement, of course, with um, my perspective. Some folks had very different stories to tell. Um, a lot of folks said that I missed out on the 2004 um, line of Bionicle and the story that was being told there. And uh, yeah, I, I probably did, um, but it, it wasn't the same, uh, it wasn't the same thing that drove me to like the franchise in the beginning. So 
I don't know. It, it, it wasn't for me in the at the end of the day. And um, I, I fight back strong. I fight back hard against the idea that the Toa Metru builds are somehow like the apex of Bionicle. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> not in this slug's opinion, at least. Uh, the Toa Metru builds are far beneath the Toa Mata, in my opinion. Uh, probably even the Toa Nuva, to an extent. Um, the, the gear function in them is, is bog standard all across the board and also weirdly obtrusive, uh, only allowing the limbs to move in certain ways. Um, I know that they've got, they got elbows and knees. That's great. That's awesome. And head articulation. That's actually a good, a really solid uh, positive change. Um, but the way that the arms are situated doesn't allow for the correct um, movement in many cases. And then the gear function impedes all of that. Um, so yeah, I think the Toa Metru builds are, um, I, I don't know, like, like two steps forward, three steps backwards, in my opinion, so, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe the only thing I regret about this video is the maybe low blow um, towards Bionicle G2 that I kind of give it. Um, just CCBS, not willing to understand CCBS, that sort of thing. Um, it's a bad look for me, to be honest, just to be willfully ignorant, I suppose. Um, so I sought to correct it, and I have since purchased a, gra <laughs> a, a lot, <laughs> a lot of CCBS sets. And um, yeah, we, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be diving into that, obviously, at a future date. So I look forward to that. Biker Bob. This is another video that was a long time coming, a long time in the making. Uh, this is one of the sets that I got from that sealed collection that I talked about way back when. Um, and I finally got a chance to crack it open, write a script, and uh, talk about this interesting character. Now, in keeping with the sort of trend that I had going here um, with like the uh, great Lego Plague of 2002, I did a lot of research, a lot of number crunching for this video as well. And unfortunately, whenever you do a ton of research and you put your neck out like this, you get something wrong. It's it just, <laughs> at least it continuously happens to me. <laughs> so it's better just to, you know, stay back and not make claims about these sorts of things because you'll get something factually wrong, I guess. Uh, at least I, I, I've had that experience. Um, anyways, the thing I got uh, factually wrong in this case here had to do with the Station Master character, the Super Station Master, and that Lego set uh, that, that they came with. Um, I, I guess I just assumed that there were two different versions of the set, one with the Super Station Master and one with just kind of a regular looking Station Master person. Um, no, apparently they, they both heads are included in the same set and it allows you to transform the Station Master into Super Station Master. And that's a cool play feature. That, that is legitimately awesome. So that's a blunder on my part. Um, it affects the math somewhat, but, but not, not uh, overwhelmingly so. So I don't know. Uh, the other thing I got wrong too is that there is a ninja character that has a unique head and torso printing that I just forgot about. I just completely missed it. I, I swear I looked at it at some point in time in my research, um, but I, I just got it wrong. Uh, so again, I apologize about that as well too. Um, none of that really happens if you don't go out of your way to do all this research though. Like if I just uh, kind of say that, hey, it's kind of unique that uh, Biker Bob was a uh, unique head and torso print back in the day. Isn't that cool? Uh, there would be no no problem with that, but the fact that I tried to put numbers to it to say that there were only seven, and these were the seven, um, that's what uh, d did me in in the end with that, so that, that's too bad. At the end of the day, these are just mistakes, and I'm only human, and uh, I can live with it. I can live with it. It's not easy being trans neon green. Uh, wow, what a video. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this one covers a wide breadth of topics, and um, some folks thought that it would be an invitation to start spewing their own opinions on the matter, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I wasn't super thrilled with a lot of the comments that this video received, um, and, and it had to do with the fact that I talked about diversity in the video. Um, obviously, the outpouring of support 
outweighs the one or two bad apples. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what it is about this topic that seems to compel some people to really lay into it, into its legitimacy and whatnot. Um, they just see it as an open invitation to just spew nonsense. So yeah, that's not great. And I tried to nip some of those in the bud. Um, obviously, I, I don't have like a moderated comment section and I, I don't... I don't have the, the time or the energy to go through and, and moderate every single comment chain that's in there. So some of the bad stuff still remains and I, I'm sorry for that, but um, it's the internet, you know, like at the end of the day, you kind of got to live with it. If, if, if you're going to live online, you got to be, be able to live with the people that also live online too. So anyways, the retirement of the color itself. Well, I, I talked about it back when I was talking about the retirement of trans neon orange. We called it back then and we knew it was gonna happen, so here we are. Um, nothing new or, or uh, exciting there, uh, or out of the ordinary, I should say. Um, but nonetheless, this was a good opportunity to talk about a few things, uh, to dive into the Friends set. That was the, the thing I wanted to do there, right? I, I picked up that Friends set, saw it as the true send-off to the color, and um, in talking about the Friends set, I felt I wanted to talk about the mini dolls as well. And in talking about the friends that I also get in this Vectrex tangent as well. So a whole lot of topics stuffed into one video. I think the video goes over really well. Like I think it flows together. It has a nice uh, upbeat energy to it. But I know at the time, even when I released this, a lot of folks were saying that it um, doesn't quite match the more calm and controlled uh, content they were used to, right? If you go back and watch some of those really old Rock Raiders videos, um, you can tell that the, the style of narration is, is quite a bit different. Um, so there, there's a bit more of a upbeat energy to this that might be too much for some folks. And I get that, I totally get it. Because when folks, um, when, I, when I watch, um, videos and and the and the creators like hey guys how's it going this is the latest blah, blah. You know, I, I get it. it it's grading so <laughs> i try to keep things cool and professional here um but sometimes you know every time you record a new uh, a new video it's a brand new slate uh you're starting from scratch you don't know how the vocal um recording process goes and that goes for recording music as well too uh it, every time you sit down and you record that first drum track anything goes anything can happen from there on out. Um, so just because you had past success in some field or some uh, recording, that doesn't guarantee future success. So you gotta, gotta take it one step at a time. The Roller Disco Arcade is a really cool set and it, it's got some really cool things about it. Um, one, one thing that I talk about in the video is the glitter backed stickers and so many people were <laughs> ready to jump down and say hey what about this one this is a glitter backed sticker blah 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 all that sort of stuff i think the only one that i legitimately missed was the solar panels on uh this this rocket ship right here and I actually have the model so i don't really have any excuse for missing that but a lot of folks were talking about the the kind of holographic stickers and explorians that doesn't count that's not the same thing um you know, glitter backed stickers is a really you know specific uh, type of sticker uh, but yeah those solar panels definitely count so uh, it's something I guess I have seen before but it's really rare it's not something Lego does a lot and I'm glad they they pulled out all the stops for this one because this set really benefits from those stickers being included yeah yeah I'm, I'm really happy with this one um, I wouldn't really change much about it um, just despite some of the, uh, I guess, the the um, vitriol in the comment section, uh, I think the video itself stands up. And, and those folks that um, didn't approach the video with good intentions um, haven't colored it negatively for me. They haven't ruined the experience for me, which is good. That's good. That rarely happens. <laughs> Slugger update number four. Slugger is now officially overrated. <laughs> this is a, maybe a response video to a lot of the upwards trajectory the channel had seen uh, in, in that time period there. Uh, going from 10,000 subs to 13,000 to 20,000 to 25,000. Now almost 30,000 today. Uh, it's crazy stuff, crazy numbers. Um, so I just wanted to make a video kind of talking about that a little bit and pointing out that 
maybe you should go back and check out the birthday video and the 1012 subscriber special. Those are good videos to watch, right? So that's what I wanted to do. And at the same time too, I had a lot of other creators that I wanted to plug as well in this video. And um, yeah, I had a lot of fun working with them too. To the point of um, calling myself overrated, <laughs> I had a lot of folks uh, rush in to defend me, <laughs> and I, I appreciate the, the thought, uh, but at the end of the day, if your content is being regarded as overrated by others, and the reason why I'm using that phrase is because of uh, communities that have formed, maybe anti-slugger communities that have formed in places such as 4chan that I am aware of. Um, that, that sort of stuff of, you know, of people coming together and saying, oh, no, that, that person's overrated, you know, uh, that, that's a good problem to have. Um, that, that tells me that folks speak very highly of my content, um, and that's awesome. That means that for the vast majority of people, they are in love with it, and, and they like what they see. It, it's a good problem to have. And so for the few folks to come along and say that, oh no, this person's overrated, that's, they, they can only ever be the minority in that, in that regard, right? So if you are a creator of something and folks are calling your content overrated, you should take that as a compliment, an immense compliment, uh, compliment because that speaks to the way that the vast majority of people see your work. And if they see it as high art and they, they hold it in high regards, you can, you can rest assured that what you're doing is the right thing. So, you wanna get into Dino Island? Well, have I got a video for you. Oh my goodness, this was another huge project, a huge project, and it took so many months of both building the sets and writing the script and taking photos and all this sort of stuff. The script for this video was the longest I had ever uh, created for this channel up till that point. So, um, yeah. To say that this was an undertaking is an understatement, that's for sure. The video itself here I think is fantastic. Uh, the execution is better than I imagined it. So that speaks very positively to where I, uh, how far I've come I suppose as a content creator, as a person who makes videos online. So this, this is a really, really a uh, highlight uh, I think for me. Not only was it a, uh, a successful video, a successful production, but it was a, a, a real eye-opener as well into Dino Island. And I hope it was for you as well, uh, because uh, just like with Galador, I kind of went in with an open mind. I, you know, I, I uh, had always heard this was the bad one, right? <laughs> Everyone kind of poo-pooed uh, Dino Island because it's juniorized, right? There's that word coming back again, right? It's all juniorized. It's terrible, therefore, right? Um, but my experience with the theme was almost the exact opposite, and I left seriously reconsidering my opinions of Egypt and uh, the Amazon sub theme as well, as well as Orient Expedition, because I was, um, as I was making this video, I was well into pre-production on Orient Expedition and building those sets and, and all, all that. So this, um, this dive into Dino Island really made me reconsider some of my positive opinions of Orient Expedition. Um, it used to be in my brain that Orient Expedition was the apex of adventurers. Um, I, I don't think I have that opinion anymore. And uh, as a result of doing the Dino Island series and, and doing this set, or this video here rather, um, I, I now am kind of of the opinion that you know, Dino Island has raised a ton of stock in my mind. And Orient Expedition has it's kind, of, uh, kind of gone down a bit. So I don't know which, which, two, which of the two series I think overall is better, but they're very different at the end of the day too. Um, there's a lot of successful stuff going on in Dino Island though. It is worthy of, of a second look. I guess the last thing I'll mention is the new addition to the Slugometer screens, where I have the green crystal with the, the brief bullet points of positive notes and the red crystal with brief bullet points of negative notes. Uh, someone had pointed out that it should have been a drained uh, purple crystal. That would be more in theme with the, um, the slimy slug motif. And yeah, maybe that was a missed opportunity there, um, but more universally green and red are seen as pros and cons. So I, we went with that to decision in the end. 
<laughs> the mini granite grinder. <laughs> Uh, this was a funny little video, I think. Um, but if we want to talk about mistakes, well, th this mistake I made in this video was so massive, I had to make a follow-up video the very next day. <laughs> so, anyways, the, the idea her here was that I uh, wanted to jokingly go about building this set that had just come out only for the granite grinder in it. Now, obviously, that's not why I bought this set in, in, the, in the long run here, but it, it was funny to think about at the time. So I decided to make this little joke video about it. Um, and then following it up, the very next video I had to make because I got the build wrong. I just built it incorrectly and forgot three pieces off the back of the granite grinder. I didn't catch it at the time. I was really kicking myself. Um, so I had to I had to make right. I had to do it right. So I went back and redid all the photography and made a whole new video. And in a roundabout way, it's kind of kind of fun that it happened because I think the second video is actually better than the first video. I think the follow-up is more funny. <laughs> now, of course, I got accused by uh, some folks, probably jokingly, that I intentionally messed it up, right? <laughs> In order to drive more traffic to the site and, and all that. That that would, that would maybe be true if I had monetized either one of those videos, but neither one is monetized. Um, again, that's just because that I made those videos in a day and it's it's really tempting when you have that instant money button just to press that button and get rewarded with money for making cheap, very quick uh, content like this. I get paid just as much for making a video of this length as I do spending weeks, spending months making so you think you wanna get into Dino Island in a video like that. So, I don't know. I, I decided ultimately to not take the money in this regard, and hopefully hopefully that has helped continue to steer me off the path of making short form content like this a regular thing and making long form content a thing of the past. So a brief return to Dino Island. Um, I had more thoughts I wanted to share, and they just couldn't fit into the already mammoth uh, project that I had going on there. So I had to put some things just off to the side and try to make a follow-up video afterwards. So that's what this video was, just basically a follow-up with some of the, the points. It wasn't scripted, um, so I went through and just tried to do my best to, to talk through it. And hopefully it's got enough interesting points that it's uh, a valuable piece of content on the, on the channel. Um, I think it does, I, th I think it dives into enough uh, interesting topics and um, sets the stage for what to expect going forward. I, I, I think the whole reason, like the, the, the thesis, or I guess the, the, the central impetus behind making this follow-up video was that I was sad to put away the Dino Island sets because <laughs> I'd spent so much time working with them that only having them in one video just it felt like such a waste to me almost because uh, I, I knew after I was done, it was on to Orient Expedition, time to pack in the Dino Island and sets and probably never talk about them again, right? So, I don't know. It kind of, kind of felt, uh, it, it, it uh, made me feel sad uh, to do that. So I wanted to kind of just spend a little bit more time with them. Uh, there, there's nothing stopping me from, from going back and talking about these sets in greater detail later. Uh, so you, you never know. You might see a deeper dive into some of them in the future. Uh, but for now, yeah, this is kind of closing, closing the curtain. It's curtain call for them. All right, speaking of Orient Expedition, here it is. And uh, this is the primer episode to get the series started. An absolutely, in my opinion, necessary part of, of this adventure. And uh, the central disclaimer that takes up the bulk of this video uh, absolutely had to be there. And I think the proof's in the pudding. The, the comment section reflects um, exactly why <laughs> that disclaimer needs to be there. Because <laughs> some folks were coming at this from a very different angle than I was, uh, I'll, I'll, I will admit. Um, a lot, although I will say the, the majority of folks um, seemed very supportive and honestly the video went over a lot better than I thought it would. Uh, so that's good, that's a positive thing. Um, the, the, the folks that really took umbrage with the fact that there was a disclaimer or that I had anything negative 
negative to say about the cultural context surrounding these sets. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a very vocal, very tiny minority. So um, that, that's cool. That's cool. That, 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 that shows me that uh, I'm on the right path with this sort of stuff. I, I didn't misstep. I didn't misspeak. And uh, that's good. That's good. You're not going to be able to please everybody. Um, I, I learned a long time ago as a teacher, you're just not going to be everybody's favorite teacher. So, you, you know, you don't, don't stress about trying to be. <laughs> you want to be the best teacher that you can be. You want to be the best person that you can be uh, in, in any given day, but you're not going to be everybody's favorite. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I think a lot of folks, I, I, see it, I see it happen a lot with content creators on YouTube. They stress about the comment section or they get overly attached to what people have to say negative opinions it can ruin the whole thing for them and th i totally i totally understand that you know, there are going to be aspects of of this that um are, are negative and and that's going to be different from person to person uh, however, for myself, I have found that um, I'm very successfully able to separate my worth, my self-worth, from the comments left by random strangers on the internet, right? <laughs> so, like, it's nice to receive positive comments, and I, and I really have connected with a lot of people. Um, but when, when someone has something mean or nasty to say, what, what, what's, it, what's it to me? It doesn't matter to me, right? Uh, they're just a random person somewhere on the planet that has something mean to say. Like, it wouldn't be the first time, so <laughs> whatever, whatever, right? And I think I think having a thick skin like that is, is really important if you're going to stick your neck out like this and uh, share opinions of things or create art because um, you're going to get negative comments all the time as musician or as a musician I should I should say it happens all the time right and not everyone likes all types of music I for one am a very picky listener when it comes to music um, I don't ne necessarily go out of my way to, to demonize other artists because I, I also think I'm a decent human being <laughs> but um, uh, yeah so you know internet arguments isn't my foray uh, it's just not not where I'm at that. Um, but yeah, this this video understandably garnered some uh, un, unwanted uh, attention um, for, from some folks who just, I guess, thought I was going to only talk about Lego and not talk about the context surrounding the, the, the sets, uh, which in my opinion for Orient Expedition does the whole theme a huge disservice. The entire point of the theme is how it uh, turns you on to geography and history and culture. It, it, it is all about the context. That's what makes the series good. <laughs> if I was just gonna talk about the sets, well, I, I guess I could, right? And there's videos out there that do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the entire point for Orient Expedition, from my perspective, is how it ties into our real world, how it ties into the greater context. They, they had sites on, like the website was designed with the uh, intent to teach uh, young builders about these other uh, areas of the world that is done intentionally they didn't have to do that but they themselves the lego group themselves have indicated to us um, as as viewers and as fans that it's intended to be viewed with a larger context with a broader scope of history um, so I think folks that narrow-mindedly just look at the sets themselves and say that it's ridiculous to consider any sort of broader context um, they're missing the point of the series entirely and um, I, I mean they're not gonna find what they look for or what they're looking for with my videos and that's fine that's fine they'll, they'll find it elsewhere I'm sure so now we dive deeper into India with two different sets, Jungle River and Red Eagle. Um, this video, just off the top here, from a produ uh, production standpoint here, was the one of the first times I'd gone back and done the dreaded uh, thumbnail refresh. Uh, my first thumbnail was it was just bad, and I, I felt bad even uh, posting it at the time. I was like, you know what, I should have spent more time on this. Um, so I went back and redid it, and the new thumbnail's a lot lot catchier um, and it represents what the video is about I think better so yeah a, a good change overall I don't want to make a, that a force of habit though of course I want to get it right the first time that's important 
Now in this video I talk a little bit about the crocodile shrine and uh, some of the, some of the other things and I had a lot of folks weigh in on what their thoughts were and I really appreciate that and I, I want to show some of that stuff off eventually. I think I want to get through all the India sets first and then we'll do a quick recap of the adventure so far and then move on from there. So I won't speak too much to it uh, here in this video. So now we're taking a look at Tigura's Roar, and in this video, I think it is the first time I have a little bit of regret about the primer episode of Orient Expedition, and that's in the whole 1925 um, time period, the setting, and establishing that uh, here rather than in the primer episode, um, I, I really should have tried to do that in the primer episode, and I kind of regret not being able to do that. Uh, because, like, if we look back at time cruisers, I was explaining the 3777 time period back in that primer episode. I really should have tried harder to make it work in this primer episode. I just couldn't find a, a, an organic spot to fit it into the script. I already felt like that one had good flow to it and everything. So I didn't want to mess with it too much, and I just decided, you know what, I'll just bring it up later. I'll bring it up when it becomes relevant. Um, but, you, you know, I wish I could have established that in the primer episode. Uh, but here it is. And it looks like enough people have hopefully seen this episode that um, it, it will continue to be in everyone's mind as we go forward with this uh, series. But uh, yeah, 1925. I feel like it's a great year, like a, a really good year to set adventurers in because you are, especially uh, adventurers set in the real world, right? Where, we, where you go to China, you go to India, Tibet, all, the, all these other regions, um, because you avoid World War I and you avoid World War II, and you avoid a lot of the lead up to World War II as well too. So it's basically the, this perfect little time period, this little time capsule to set your story in to avoid two major world conflicts. And I think that was very smart, if it was intentional. I think it was a very smart call. Some viewers were quick to point out that 1910 seems far too early as a time period, given the types of vehicles and airplanes that we see um, in the series, and I, I agree as well too. And 1910 was established all the way back with the original German radio play, um, but that date doesn't, doesn't gel as well with the series as it's presented. Obviously, one of the big topics of discussion in this video was trying to ascertain the origin of the Tigura legend, and I received a ton of comments uh, to that nature, to that effect. And I, I don't want to dive into that topic right now in this video because I'm actually saving it for a future Orient Expedition video where I'm going to uh, discuss that in more detail. Um, just know that I've gone through the comments and, and I've read them and I really appreciate all the insight uh, that came into that. Some of it was stuff that I was already aware of and some of it was new to me, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I was really excited to look at the Temple of Gloom in this set as well too. It might be one that gets featured in a future LEGO Studios video, but um, you know the the correlation between Temple of Gloom and Tigura's Roar it, it, it's it's inescapable. <laughs> it's it's very apparent, right? Uh, so so I uh, I really liked showing that set off, and um, it, it was neat. It was neat to be able to photograph such an old nostalgic set of mine. Just like in the Time Cruisers videos, there is a ton of video content uh, here showing off the, the play features rather than doing it through stop motion animation for the same reasons. I wanted to show that this is what the set does on its own. It doesn't require it, the fakery or forgery of stop motion animation to make it move like this. And I feel like video clips uh, are the best way to do that. Lastly, this is also the introduction to the cards that will play a part of the Orient Expedition board game. And I just have to say, I'm a really big fan of how I chose to present this, uh, the editing and bringing the cards out one by one and showing off the stats and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, I, I think it's really um, satisfying to watch as a viewer. So um, yeah, I think I'll try to keep continue doing that in the series as we go forward um, into Mount Everest and beyond. I guess I should also mention the alternate builds as well too. Um, I think I received enough comments from people saying that they wanted to see the alternate builds, so I decided to, you know, go out on a limb and try them out here. 
and gosh darn it I, I was really impressed with them <laughs> so um, I think alternate builds are probably here to stay for the series I, I don't want to make any promises of course and probably with the smaller sets I'll just skip them anyways um, but at least with the mid-sized sets and any set that is including cards I, I probably will look at the alternate builds for them as well <laughs> the Orient Expedition April 1st special. <laughs> this is going to sound completely asinine, but you really have no idea how much was leading up to this video. I had planned out the release of this video months in advance and had slotted in all the other Orient Expedition sets in, in time leading up to this week after week. I, I planned them out, right? <laughs> because, because this joke only works, I think, if you have the context surrounding the, the board game cards. And so we had to get to Tigura's Roar a week ahead of this one. And in order to do that, I had to also do the Jungle River and the primer episode in time. So there, there was a lot of steps that led up to that. In order to do the primer episode, by the way, I had to get done uh, Dino Island. Like I had to be done that series first. So uh, months of preparation went into this April Fool's joke at the end of the day. <laughs> and I think the video is pretty fun. I think it's fun in the end, but it's, it's completely silly how much forethought I put into it. And now we're back to Rock Raiders. This is Lego Rock Raiders without teal or dark turquoise. This is a video idea that I've had for many, many, many months now, and it, it serves as one of only, um, or only one of a handful of Rock Raiders video topics that I still have to do. Um, <laughs> it might sound, uh, it might sound preposterous to, to say this, but I feel like I've only gotten about halfway through all of my planned Rock Raiders videos. That might be crazy talk, but um, I do have a lot of things I still have left to cover with the series. And so I could see myself talking about Rock Raiders all throughout 2023 and into 2024 as well too. Um, anyways, this is one of those topics. I just wanted to look at the theme in terms of its recoloring, what you can do without teal. If you take that color out of the palette, what does it look like, right? What do these colors actually represent in Rock Raiders? And uh, I really like that theory of worn off paint. Although I did see a lot of great comments talking about how it could be oxidized copper and that, that sort of idea. Uh, I think that's cool too. I thought it was really insightful to see how polarizing these power miners recolors were. <laughs> Some folks were really into it. They, they were saying that, wow, this really opens my eyes to what you can do with power miners. And some folks were like, this is an abomination. Why have you created this? <laughs> and I, I don't know where I sit. I, I think I, I think I kind of like them. I think I kind of like them better than the originals. It's really tough to judge though. I find it very tough to get a feel um, for the reality of bricks within uh, Studio, which is the program I used. Um, Studio, to me, looks very fake, and it's, it's tough to make things look real and believable from that program. Unfortunately, a lot of the parts you would need in order to build these just don't exist in real life, so they'll have to just remain as mock-ups like this. Uh, the other thing too is that the sets themselves were never designed to have this color distribution, so some of the pieces, especially the larger pieces, like if you think of the Thunder Driller, the top of the Thunder Driller, just one big brick, it would be really tough to recolor that in a way that could make it resemble Rock Raiders. Um, as well, there's a ton of curved parts and weird bionicle parts in Power Miners as well, and ne neither one of those would, would fit within Rock Raiders in my opinion. At the end of the day, this video is a bit of an excuse to use these brown turbine pieces that I have, and uh, I, I mean, you know, I, th I think it works quite well. I'm really happy that I was able to pick up these pieces, and I think the model I made with them uh, looks great. I, th I think it really suits its purpose quite well. Um, there's one shot at the end of the video here where I recolored a loader dozer into power miner colors and I just wanted to point out uh, the, this back shot here, the, the, the rear facing uh, photograph, um, where you can see the orange kind of tool rack piece there. And I just want to point out that that's a set exclusive piece to a Harry Potter set that I actually have as well. And uh, I just found it kind of cheeky to throw that in there and be like, hey look, you can recolor it and it uses this set exclusive piece. I just couldn't really find any organic way to call attention to that in the video, so I don't know. I just put the photo in and now I'm telling you now. <laughs>
The Elephant Caravan. In this one, we finally get to meet Sam Sinister and uh, talk about what's going on with him. <laughs> He's looking a little different these days, isn't he? Yeah. So that this uh, plays into my, I guess, disdain for adventurer's lore, uh, the the continuing storyline and whatnot. It, it's just it's not concrete at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's like putty and <laughs> just keeps changing. Uh, anyways, so Sam Sinister here, to me, he looks like a combination of Sly Boots and Baron Von Baron. You just take those two characters and mash them up. Um, and so I was likening it to like Liquid Ocelot, or uh, Liquid and uh, Revolver Ocelot, and how like grafting the arm on takes over the mind. So I was thinking like grafting the hook on <laughs> takes over the mind of the previous host. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's silly, and it goes uncommented on officially. Um, so I, I don't know what to make of it. So I don't know. Thought I'd point it out in this video at least. Pippin and Babloo are cool characters though, um, and they have some really great minifigures in this set especially. Um, some folks were quick to point out uh, that uh, Pippin's camera could possibly have existed in 1925. It would have been cutting edge technology there. And I'll talk more about that in more detail when I do a follow up uh, to this, I guess, season of uh, uh, the Orient Expedition retrospective series. But yes, it, it, technically it is possible that Pippin's camera could have looked more like that and maybe even plausible because she is a journalist so maybe she was on top of the technology at the time and so yeah I'd accept that explanation I think I think it, uh, it checks out a lot of folks were really interested in the elephant in this set and, and how could you not be honestly it, it's such a great Lego animal and uh, it doesn't have any modern equal um, before or since I should say actually really it really stands alone and unfortunately, because of this, it's very expensive and it makes getting this set uh, prohibitively expensive. And so I don't know what to what to recommend about this. Um, I, I know uh, Brian talks about this in his video on the topic on Brian's bricks. Um, basically, with this set, it's it's too expensive to be something that you can recommend people to pick up. So, I don't know, because it's really not worth the price now. Um, it was back then, and it, it still is a really cool set, a really good display piece, I find. Probably even better than it is for play, it's better for display, it's, it's really eye-catching. But, at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's really expensive now. It, it's, it's similar to the Adventurer's Blimp, the Adventurer's Zeppelin uh, set. That, that's the one set that's basically keeping me from ever talking about the Amazon <laughs> series. Uh, because it's just so expensive for what it is. And that's, that's what we have here as well. Um, while I can't recommend you go out and purchase it, um, th there it is, right? So if, if I were to give it the slugometer rating, uh, you know, it's probably going to score quite low on the slugometer just because of how expensive it is these days. So in researching the content for this video, I had to do a little bit of digging into elephant training and the practices of Mahout across the world. Um, and that, uh, that whip, <laughs> that whip piece included here, uh, it really didn't coincide with anything positive I was able to find. Now, I know a lot of folks were saying that, like, you don't necessarily have to actually strike the animal with the whip. You can whip the air in front of them as, as a command, and yeah, I, I get that. I, I understand. And perhaps that's um, what was intended here, um, though I couldn't find any evidence of that being a, um, <laughs> a sanctioned method of training animals, uh, or elephants, I should say. Um, so, yeah, 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 that that's maybe unfortunate, but again, and I, I hope I, I don't um, I, I hope I don't come across as trying to cast derision upon the set designers because I think it just frankly comes from a place of ignorance, not a place of um, malicious intent. So that's that's where I'm coming from at least. I, I want to point it out just to say that hey, this isn't actually the way it's supposed to be, but I don't want to make it seem like I'm pointing the finger and saying that no, these people did this wrong and we should be mad at them, blah blah blah, that sort of stuff, right? Diff different era, a lot less, uh, they had way Way less access to um, online resources like we do now so it's just it is what it is and so I think it's worth pointing out and saying that this isn't correct but I'm also not trying to point blame as well 
I don't know why I keep getting surprised by how many set exclusive and rare parts there are in these Orient Expedition sets, but this one really was eye-opening for me. <laughs> There's just so much about this set that isn't available anywhere else, um, and uh, that makes it unique. Very unique set. I've always felt that this car build, Sam Sinister's car in this set, was somewhat lacking. Um, and upon going through and looking at the um, uh, Dino Island vehicles, and then coming to this one, it really put uh, this this one in a, a kind of lackluster uh, light. So um, I wanted to go through and offer up some set modifications. I, it, it's definitely not something I do much these days, and uh, I try to be as reserved in that principle as I can be. I did it a lot with the Rock Raiders series, um, I guess both because I was new and trying to cut my teeth in this sort of uh, so, this sort of field here. Um, but nowadays I try to sing the praises of the of the stock set, the retail set, uh, unless there is something glaringly obvious that should be changed, like that rear wheel on the time tunnel later, for example. Um, that those sort of things, I feel more confident saying that you know here's my set modification. With this car, I, I chose to do as little as I could to it to improve it, so it's not an overhaul or anything like that. It's just small little things to add more detail, add more of the traditional elements that we're used to seeing in Adventurer the printed uh, windshield, for example, the license plate, that sort of stuff. And I really like the end result. So yeah, hopefully uh, th these modifications are valuable. Kept you waiting, huh? <laughs> Onto the ore refinery. At long last, we finally return to the How to Build Rock Raiders series. And it if you've been waiting for this video, I apologize. And the, the reason why you've been waiting for this video is going to frustrate the heck out of you. It all comes back to the April Fools video. <laughs> <laughs> really, it does. It does. Um, because I, there were so many videos that had to be made in in uh, preparation for that in order to line up with the April 1st date. Uh, I had to push something to the back burner and this series was the one that got pushed to the back burner. So I, I apologize. It was all for an elaborate joke. I'm so sorry. Anyways, I see this video as a return to form and I think it's a strong addition to the overall series. I think the pacing's pretty good, and all the information is presented in a clear, concise manner, and it leads us to the build instructions, which, uh, as always, I always test them out myself before I publish them, um, because the process of building, uh, of making these build instructions is I take an already completed model, and I slowly disassemble it, taking pictures of the pieces that I remove, and then taking them off to the side. And basically, what you're watching is me photograph the disassembly of the model, which which I then reverse when it comes time to uh, make the, the build instructions. And sometimes this works flawlessly. Sometimes, it, it, like in this video, I think it works really well. It makes a lot of logical sense. It's probably because I've had some experience with it uh, now. Um, but there used to be a time where I would do this sort of method and I would get things, like I'd take things apart in the wrong order. And I think a big one here is wheels. You have to, you have to, have to, have to wait until the end to um, put the wheels onto a build so that means when you're disassembling it the wheels have to come up uh, come off first and the reason is is because as you start disassembling the body of the vehicle the chassis becomes weaker and weaker and if you are reversing that flow that means you're pressing bricks down onto a chassis that already has wheels suspending it and oftentimes that can lead to the chassis just breaking apart so it, it's really important and it, it's the whole reason and I think that uh, Lego build instructions always put the wheels on last. We're always waiting to that final step to plug in the wheels and, and put them on. Uh, just because it, uh, get, it removes the stability of, of the model having the wheels there. So you want to make sure that you wait until the very end before you pop them on. I guess one last thing I'll mention here, at the end of the ore refinery video, we talk about the back of the of the model and how it probably uses these tunnel transport pieces. Um, there, there is one more piece of supporting evidence um, in addition to what's in the video there, uh, and it's the texture file itself. If you look at the texture file, it actually shows the shading along the sides here, and those are shadows being cast um, on the bricks because the slope is deeper. There. 
there and it isn't in line with the other uh, yellow slopes on either side. So that's another uh, piece of supporting evidence right there. Uh, I, I think the video stands even without including it there because of uh, um, all, all the other reasons already stated, but uh, there it is, there it is. It also helps support our hypothesis there. Lego Dreams. So I'm uh, kind of excited to see where this leads. It's uh, the first original Lego theme I've been really excited for in a long time. Uh, Monkey Kid was cool, Hidden Side was also kind of cool. Both of those themes though didn't quite hit all the marks for me. Uh, for Hidden Side I felt like the Lovecraftian horror aspect of it was really, really cool but none of the sets in any of the waves really took it to the full mile. They didn't quite get to the, the end zone, if you know what I mean. Um, and for Monkey Kid, uh, while there are certain elements of these uh, sets I do like, a lot of them boil down to being basically the big mechs or giant vehicles uh, that we are used to seeing in Ninjago, which is another original IP that I really just don't care for at all. So with uh, uh, dreams these new sets here I'm actually quite excited by what I see now granted they, they, they got me by making them Galador compatible and Galador scaled so <laughs> I'm uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm being targeted here <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, I'm definitely in for a penny in for a pound uh, for this theme uh, at least so far I, now I don't plan on going out and buying every single set that uh, is in this theme or at least in the first wave here, but I could see myself grabbing three or four of them, that's for sure, yeah. In the comment section, I heard from a number of people that are uh, concerned for this theme, and uh, I share these concerns, believe me, I, I do. Um, I'm still kind of waiting to see what the hook of the series is. I don't quite see the, <laughs> I don't quite see the dream yet, right? <laughs> um, for me, what I like so far are a few of the sets, uh, namely the crocodile car especially, um, and I really want to go out and grab a few of them. Uh, pretty much right right as they release day one. Maybe do a, um, uh, a stream where I put them together on live stream and uh, we see how they are. I don't know. I certainly don't plan on steering the channel into only talking about these modern uh, releases, and uh, I'm quite behind on a few modern sets that I have picked up, uh, and I'm with the intent of making videos for. So, um, yeah, I don't think that uh, I don't think that's a match made in heaven uh, between Slugger and modern Lego. Uh, but I I'm gonna try it out. I'm gonna try this uh, series out a little bit at least, and uh, see where it goes. I'm really curious to see how these sets feel in hand once you have them built, and uh, the building process itself, uh, it's, it's intriguing, this idea of a comic book style instruction method. Um, and they're really going out of their way to say it's all paper instructions, so, so we'll see what that looks like. Um, I know from my own personal preferences, I actually prefer to use the app. I prefer building uh, using the LEGO Builder app when I can, uh, if it's a modern set. And if it's an older set, uh, usually I'll use the instruction booklet if I have it. Um, but uh, one of the things I'm not a big fan of, um, these days at least, is the print quality of these instruction books. Now, I think part of what that is, is that LEGO now has so many more colors in any given set uh, that I find, sometimes find, especially in low light, if, if I'm building without like really bright lights on or anything, uh, it can be really tough to discern some of the color differences between the pieces in the instruction book. Like, it's tough to tell, is this a light aqua piece? or some sort of other weird uh, bright lime or something, I don't know. Uh, there's just so many shades of blue in modern LEGO. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's really tough for me to tell some of that apart sometimes. Um, so in a roundabout way, I sometimes find older instruction books to be easier to follow although they come with their own um, hardships. So I don't know if we've hit that perfect medium, that perfect balance between the two, but I definitely find the uh, the, the screen, like being able to turn up the brightness on, on a, an LED screen um, to be useful in building. Lastly too, I, I suppose I didn't talk about the price tags attached to these sets. I know some people have been saying it's like a nightmare and some people have been saying that prices are like a dream come true. And I think 
both are right in some regards. It's really inconsistent. I, I'm having a hard time understanding some of the prices, to be honest. So I mentioned the crocodile car earlier because that's the one for me. That's uh, I, 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 even though it has uh, what is a ridiculous $80 Canadian price tag on it, $80 for less than 500 pieces. Um, yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, and and I, I just, maybe I'll spend some VIP points or something to, to make it uh, a little bit easier. But yeah, that that's, ouch, yeah, that, that hurts. <laughs> um, at the same time though, some of these other ones, Bunchy the Bunny, uh, only being $25 Canadian, that's a steal. That's a great price for that. I think the Dream Village is another one I think is really effectively priced. Um, that and the, the Treehouse as well. Uh, the Treehouse, I, I probably need to see that one in person to see just how big it is it feels substantial and the price uh, to part ratio even though that's not you know the absolute metric the price to volume of stuff there feels good uh, at least from a, an outsider's perspective but then you look at the shark ship the nightmare shark ship and that one while only being about 150 pieces more is about 40 dollars more canadian at least here um, so a significant jump up in price so it's hard hard to tell um, <laughs> how these all kind of fit together. I'm having a hard time digesting some of the price tags. So, I don't know. I guess I guess we'll see what, what it looks like, and hopefully when I go check out the LEGO store in August uh, to pick up some of these sets, they'll have a few of them built on display. I think what's uh, really interesting about this whole series, at least so far, is seeing how all-in LEGO is about it. Um, and if the theme's going to survive, they're going to have to continue that uh, that push, that marketing push, well into August. Um, so we'll see we'll see where it goes. So far, so good. I think this is a really good first step. They've kind of put their foot in the door here, and uh, they have a lot of people interested, myself included. Um, but if it's going to succeed, it's going to need further marketing. Uh, like it's the toy industry; everything lives and dies by the marketing here. Um, so they're going to have to continue to push and push and push. And uh, yeah, let's hope it's not throwing good money after bad. It's time to talk about the clock, the Orient Expedition clock. And to be honest, I cannot believe that I had the opportunity to make this video. It was something I 110% thought, there's no way I'm ever gonna find one of these. There's no way I'm ever gonna have one and be able to talk about it. Just cause it's so rare. It is so rare. It's so tough to find these Lego clocks for sale. And I, I mean, I guess I lucked out and I've got two of them now, which is kind of crazy. And actually, you know, I, I kind of poo pooed the uh, Alpha Team clock in that uh, video, but I kind of like it. Like the, the uh, the design of the, of the clock face itself is really nice and I was able to borrow the uh, battery cover from it uh, to use on my <laughs> Orient Expedition clock so that's pretty cool too. Um, both of them are, are really neat. Um, I obviously can't make purchasing uh, purchasing recommendations uh, on them because they, they're just so rare. If you see them and it's a good price, you know, pick it up if you're interested. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, and and they've been pretty good too, the, the, both of these clocks. I've been trying to keep, uh, keep a tally on like, are they keeping time? Are they falling behind? That sort of thing. And they've been pretty solid. Um, the big Lego gears on the back can make it really easy to bump the the hands off so you want to I, I guess maybe remove the gears once you have it set up at the right time um, the the alarm system is okay it, it's it's an analog solution it's very imprecise I wouldn't rely on it uh, <laughs> I tried uh, using it uh, when I was cooking pizza recently and uh, it didn't go off and my pizza got a little overcooked as a result but I think that's more on me than <laughs> than anything. <laughs> This now puts us in spitting distance of the Scorpion Palace, which I'm looking forward to. However, it is going to be massive. The video is going to be utterly massive. I, I can disclose a little bit of what I've done as pre-production so far. Um, me and my friends went through and we played the board game a couple of times, came up with revisions and alterations. All of that's gonna be included in the video, as well as talking about the set, the alternate builds, the add-on peripherals, all these sorts of things, right? So all of that's gonna happen. And so far I've written up about six pages of script. 
Um, and those six pages are exclusively about the board game experience. So it's going to be big. It's going to be very big. And typically I find, just, just as an aside, um, uh, whenever I write a page of script, that typically equates to about three minutes of screen time. So one page is about three minutes. Um, so you can do the math and kind of figure out where we're going to be from there. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be big. And there you go two full years on YouTube. And uh, judging by the runtime of this video, my goodness, <laughs> we've done a lot. We've done a lot, over a hundred videos. And um, if you've sat through and listened to myself <laughs> for over three hours now, I, I thank you. Um, obviously this kind of stands as a bit of a vanity project at the end of the day. Listen to me talk about myself for over three hours, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, at the same time, I hope there's been something valuable gleaned from this uh, this little endeavor. I don't know what I'm going to do next year. Um, probably not recapping from the beginning, but I could see a yearly recap being a, a thing going forward. I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, it, obviously, a ton of work went into it <laughs> to be able to edit and put all this together. And there's no way I could have scripted this, of course. I, I would be waiting until the, the third year anniversary to even start production on the video. It would take so long. Um, yeah, so so that's what we're looking at here. Um, I, a couple of, I guess, closing remarks here that I wanted to disclose as well, too. Um, one thing that will happen to you if you are going to do something similar, like what Slugger's doing here on the channel, is that you're going to experience um, the, the limits of the niche that you are within, right? Uh, what I mean by that is that a lot of your videos are gonna end up looking like this. They, they aren't gonna grow your channel. They're gonna seem stagnant. It's gonna seem like you're just ro walking around in circles. And, and that's fine, that's fine. As long as they're quality content, people will come and they'll watch it. At least that's been my experience. Quality rises to the surface and it might take time. Uh, a lot of the history of my channel um, has been under a thousand subscribers. You can actually see that that benchmark there, right? With the 1,012 subscriber special. Everything prior to that is under a thousand subscribers. And as long as you just continue making quality stuff, eventually people will come and check it out and they'll watch it and you just gotta stick with it. So that's my advice as a, as a creator of, of this sort of medium. Thank you so much for watching here, everybody. Um, I've been your host, RR Slugger, and here's to another great year on YouTube. Thank you.